So, what is going to happen uh, uh, today, this this afternoon, in uh, afternoon in Europe and uh, morning in America? We will be joined by America a little bit later on. So, I'm going to I'm going to start uh, this first uh, for, for a few minutes. I'm just going to to welcome you all and and to thank you, give you a big thank you for submitting papers here and to taking your time to do all these administrative stuff to join the to join this workshop in the conference and and to be here uh, to be here today for the rest of the afternoon and uh, well I will, I'll introduce myself I know all of you yeah so about those who don't know me so well I'm I'm Manuel Leon from the University of Southampton. I'm a lecturer here, and I, I'm also the head of, uh, of learning of a, of a venture, uh, an online kind of online data science academy, okay, uh, in which we teach data science to professionals, yeah, data science and, of course, data literacy, yeah. So, uh, and actually, the, the very latest. Uh, uh, direction of the of of Southampton Data Science Academy is tilting towards the uh, the enhancement of data literacy rather than going more deep into deep uh, uh, data science techniques. Okay, so it's uh, we are making it more. I'm not going to say lightweight, but more uh, but more oriented to to data literacy to the, to the topic actually to the to the actual topic of this uh, of this workshop. Uh, so this is this is about myself, and then um, I uh, and we are um, we are going to have a few sessions today. And the sessions, apart from this opening, then, then there will be a, a round table. Four of us. I have invited myself into that round table, um, and there will be four of us talking uh, uh, talking about uh, this kind of transition from education to uh, so to. To industry, so all those uh, all those competencies that that uh, they are thought to be needed around data literacy in the industry and how education is supplying uh, those um, or serving the community to uh, to to supply those data literacy competencies. So uh, and we will spend some uh, half an hour talking about it. Uh, with with Davide, with um, with uh, Slatko instead uh, in in play in the place of Ulya Samarjanovic and, and Andrea and myself. Then um, Chris, Christopher De Bruin and and maybe other authors, but mainly Christopher De Bruin will uh, will uh, present the. Results. The, the second results of, of a very nice project, by the way. I'm, I'm very nice. Uh, it's called Dalida, and he will tell us about it. Um, after that, we will have a little break. I think yes. After that, we will have a little break, and uh, of some twenty minutes, and then uh, three. Say at three European time, we will uh, we will we will have the Open Data Institute uh, to show us their uh, their progress into into um, providing data literacy training. Very interesting as well. Uh, I advise you all that we have some interactions together between the Open Data Institute and the University of Southampton, and the Open Data Institute has a fundamental role in. The creation of Southampton Data Science Academy, which is uh, which is where we do the online courses on data literacy here in Southampton, and then uh, and then uh, uh, yeah, my Slavko will uh, will present Maya's and and Slavko's and Ulyas's uh, paper from the University of Novi Sad, and uh, quite an interesting as well. We, a look and we liked it all and finally um from america we uh, convinced um 
one of the most uh, cited authors around the topic of data literacy. Her name is Ellen Mandinach. She will join later on because it's really early uh, right now there where she is. I think she's in Arizona or something and it's crazy early. So she will, uh, she will wake up very early anyway to, to do her, uh, her keynote. And after that keynote, we will be free to bombard her with all the questions that we will have. Yeah. And she will be happy to, she will be happy to have this plenary discussion uh, with the rest of us, which will be moderated by Davide. So that's the, so that's what is going to happen uh, today. And um, do we have any questions so far? Before we move to the round table. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing. Yeah. And this, uh, this round table is going to be just uh, a discussion between uh, four of us. However, however, uh, because we are not so many in the in the room, we, well, I'll do it democratically between the, the, the rest of the participants of the round table, but are we happy to be interrupted, which I would be, by the rest of the, the, the people in the, in the room? Well, fine for me. I mean, I, I think that uh, would be also a good opportunity to uh, have uh, yeah, the contribution for all participants. I mean, the aim of this round table is to start discussing the topic of data literacy yeah, from different perspective. And uh, I'm sure that uh, all contributors can um, keep the uh, perspective and their point of view on the topics that would be faced. So I'm more than happy if uh, all of us can intervene in the-, in the Yeah, discussion. that's perfect. So the- the uh, the round table has just been made bigger yeah so yeah yeah so it has a bigger radius now or a bigger diameter <laughs> okay so um we are going to divide this round table in three main uh, in three main topics okay uh well in three main sections not topics the in the first sections we will introduce ourselves a little bit and we will introduce the the topic and in the in the second section, yeah, in the second section, which will be in in the next uh, in the ten minutes after, we will be um, uh, talking about the um, the industry and how the industry views and how the industry receives and how the how the, how the industry in general wishes uh, for the uh, for their workforce in the digital economy to uh, uh, which kind of competencies around data literacy are the most sought after. And in the final part, uh, we will talk from the sending end. So we will consider the industry as the receiving end of the people of, of, of workers trained and the uh, and and in and the and education in, and academia in general, we will consider it the sending end. So what we are doing to, what are we doing, not only to research about what's best, but also to prepare all these, uh, all these uh, skilled uh, staff workers into the digital economy and, 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 and in, into data literacy for them to not only succeed professionally, but also contribute to a uh, better digital um, world, okay? So um, I would say that before um, I was going to introduce everyone, um, um, but I think I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. So they will, they will talk about, uh, about their role in their organization and their role around data literacy. And I could start with you, Davide. Yeah, sure. 
I'm David Taibbi, and I am a, a researcher of the Institute for Educational Technology of uh, the National Research Council of uh, Italy. Um, yeah, my uh, research area is quite wide. I mean, I, I'm, uh, I'm working in the research uh, since uh, 2001, so it's more than 20 years now. Uh, and so I, I, my uh, main research interests were in um, mobile uh, devices or uh, for the education, uh, semantic web for education, more recently on learning analytics. And um, in the last two years, I had the opportunity to uh, coordinate two European projects on the data literacy. I would like to uh, share with you uh, two links in which this two uh, project has been uh, presented. I mean, as the uh, European uh, portal of, for the, the projects. Uh, the first uh, is the uh, Daedalus project, which is a um, project on uh, a strategic uh, partnership founded by the Erasmus Plus program uh, that uh, has the aim of uh, um, investigating the uh, uh, adoption, let me say, of uh, the data literacy approach in the, into the university courses. Maybe we will talk about that later more. Uh, and the second one is that the, um, a knowledge alliance uh, is uh, again is still on the Erasmus Plus program, but is a bigger project with uh, 14 partners all over the Europe. Um, and in this project, we uh, involved not only universities, but also business uh, partners. So we had this uh, uh, in interface, let me say, between the academic and the business uh, section. This is the reasons why I think that uh, would be uh, interesting, uh, let me say, to report what we have uh, done in this project, uh, what we have, um, uh, the, the main findings I mean, the, and what we are produced to. Uh, yeah, maybe I, I, would, I will be a bit uh, short so I can uh, give uh, all of you the possibility to introduce yourself and maybe I think Manuel, instead of uh, only the participants of the round table, I think it would be good to have uh, a presentation of all the participants to this uh, workshop. That is. Yes, I agree. Um, yeah, the round table is all of us now. So... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so maybe we can really expand this <laughs> presentation. <laughs> So we, yeah, we could go on with the other David. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, it's a good, good to be along today and, and discuss this important topic. Um, so I'm Dr. Dave Tarrant. I'm the <clears throat> head of the learning program at the Open Data Institute, um, ex Southampton. I'll be clear with that one as well. So um, there's a bit of a connection there as well. Um, and I've known Manuel quite a while as a result, but, um, but the Open Data Institute was founded by two Southampton professors, to Tim Berners-Lee and Sir Nigel Shadbolt. We'll talk a little bit about them later um, uh, and the, the influence that they've had on some of our work. So um, since I've joined the ODI with them <clears throat> in around, when we were established in 2012, so it's our 10th birthday this year. So hoping to have a big celebration. You know, if you can get back together in person, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Okay. Um, but you know, my main focus has certainly been um, to develop training programs initially, but more they're more education programs around data literacy and the increasing difference between literacy and skills that we'll talk a little bit about in our uh, session later. And I'm trying to really um, it, it work at the intersection of government, the private sector, and kind of the, the public sector to really focus on what, what are the different needs of those different industry, different sectors, um, and where does data literacy sit when it isn't just within an academic space, um, because it's really critical for entirety of society to become more literate around data. So what are the priorities there? So that's really where we've been sort of more focused in our work while also obviously <laughs> you know, contributing to work in other sectors like the SDSA, um, as Manuel mentioned, because we you know, can't do it all, but we may as well build a community, right? So that's that's been my main focus over the years to really increase the data literacy alongside the, the work we do at the Open Data Institute. Nice one, and uh, uh, and we will know much more about David later on because uh, and his work because he's going to present a paper as well and he's going to be contributing for the, through the rest of the workshop. Uh, Christoph, 
Hello. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Well, uh, the name is Christophe de Bruyne. Um, I used to be affiliated with Trinity College Dublin, but as of uh, September, I'm an assistant professor in Liège here in Belgium. Congrats. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, it's good to be back in my home country. Um, uh, so even though I, well, um, my interest in data literacy stems from the fact that I, in my research, I try to contextualize data as to facilitate data integration processes. And quickly, um, uh, we spun out a project to try to inform communities, underprivileged communities about data literacy, uh, because we found that only knowledge workers had access to that or people in tertiary education. Uh, but I'm happy to report on that later on. And I'm very, uh, I'm looking forward to hear what the others will present as well. Thank you, Christoph. And we are also looking forward to hearing about your paper and uh, um, more about Dalida. It's, it sounds familiar. I think, uh, I think we uh, briefly discussed it in a previous workshop, but I'm so looking forward to hear more about it because it's now the next stage of the, of, of the project, yeah? That's great. Andrea. Oh, hi everyone, and uh, thanks for having me. I, um, that's uh, Andrea Nelson Mauro is the, the full name from Italy, and I work in uh, Data Ninja. That is uh, that was born in uh, 2012 uh, too, and uh, but is a little is, is a little uh, a little company based in Italy that works in the field of data journalism, uh, open data, and uh, at large data-driven data, data -driven training programs. Uh, we have um, 10 years of experiences so far, and we work with a very different, uh, very different targets um, during these years, uh, from journalists to professionals, to civil servants in public institutions, to, um, you know, um, schools, uh, uh, for educators, but also for uh, students, uh, 13, 18 years old. So we uh, mainly we, we we started with a, a kind of hard skills approach uh, in the field of data uh, to in trying to in, uh, to bring in the uh, you know news digital news ecosystem in Italy and in Europe some uh, technical solutions in order to leverage data and so on. But uh, the main problem we faced at the beginning, it was that uh, we, 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 uh, we witnessed a, a strange process where uh, we were talking about topics that our um, uh, colleagues uh, would understand. So the, the, most problem, the most important problem that we uh, highlighted uh, from that point is to try to spread uh, Data science, com data science competence, data journalist competence, but uh, uh, at the basics, also data literacy competence. Because you know, uh, for the time being, I don't know if in the other in other countries the same, but in Italy we are face uh, we are facing a kind of uh, uh, basics shortage of competences. So when you talk about data with people, uh, they are very far from the the real mindset of dealing with data uh, in, in your life or every day. So uh, this uh, um, statement, this assumption uh, uh, brought us to try to uh, improve, a, to, to create a, a plan of uh, for spreading data literacy competencies at basics for everyone. So today we work with the schools, with, we have different projects and we work with schools, with professionals, with uh, um, editorial industries, news industries and so on. Um, and that's that's all i mean uh, but i don't know if you have a question thank you davide and then uh, yeah so um, you have started stating the problem that you are, are going yeah. to state in uh, in just a couple of minutes or in just a few minutes uh, after slavko and kalum introduce themselves so hi slavko Hello to everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to send regards from Uglesha. Uh, and who is Uglesha? 
<laughs> Ugesha yeah. is uh, actually uh, a professor at the University of Novi Sad, Faculty of Technical Science, and uh, he was a, a, a project member and project coordinator from the University of Novi Sad in the project of uh, data literacy and the Daedalus. And uh, uh, according to, to these uh, projects, he uh, today I will change him because I also was the member of this project from the University of Novi Sad. Uh, I'm working at the University of Novi Sad as the secretary of the chair of production systems organization and management, and also like a teaching assistant uh, on the department of industrial engineering and management. Uh, according to the data literacy, Uglesh and me together uh, in the project of uh, data lead, lead uh, give some practical exercise on the course of e-business. Actually, in the different software, we, um, we learn students how to uh, do data visualization. And in this round table, I will share with you some of our experience. Thank you. Thank you, Slavko. And uh, yeah, we will... We, you, you will, uh, Slavko is going also to introduce, uh, to, to, to present a, a, a paper um, uh, written by uh, by himself and Maya uh, and the same uh, Uliesa. Callum, hi. Hi, Manu. Thank you very much for uh, having me along here. Uh, yeah, it's great to meet you all. Um, and uh, I also benefit uh, strongly from David having done a terrific introduction of the ODI as well. So that can cut short my introduction and we can get into the good stuff. But uh, so I'm a senior researcher with the Open Data Institute. Um, I kind of work across the various different programs, but I jumped at the opportunity to be involved in this paper because it really feeds back to some of my core interests, which was looking into sort of science and technology studies way back uh, a, a long time ago so to be able to re-engage with that and sort of knowledge production comprehension and uh, communication specifically uh, these are areas which uh, I am always eager to uh, get involved in so um, yeah very much looking forward to being part of this uh, round table now as well yeah yeah you are most welcome to our table <laughs> right okay so yeah, the first big question uh, of uh, in this uh, in this discussion is something that Andrea <coughs> has actually started. Yeah, which is um, specifically in your in your industry. Uh, so Andrea's specialization is data journalism. Okay, but it expands a little bit more, and 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 uh, we would like andrea to tell us when um, when we uh, when when we are recruiting data journalists or anyone else in a related industry what uh, what are what are the main uh, competencies or features that we are looking uh, looking to incorporate in our in our companies in our uh, in our organizations in terms of data literacy. That, that's for me? Yes. So, um, uh, it depends by the job vacancy that you're publishing. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Uh, I, 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 I think that uh, if you are looking for a data scientist, the, the framework could be very clear because you need some specific competencies in terms of, you know, uh, methodologies and approach and approaches and tools. Mm. Uh, but uh, in our case, in our study from our expertise, also in terms of training uh, companies that uh, uh, that uh, do not need uh, a specific competencies, specific competencies in data science, but uh maybe with soft skills the, the most important problem is the, that kind of skill shortage sh shortage in terms of, of mindsets so when you deal with data in your life in your work um you have to to take this kind of a data-driven approach in everything you are doing yeah we are dealing with so um the most uh, the most important shortage from my side is 
that's that is a, a strong division, a strong divide between data scientists and the uh, other uh, employees, other uh, prof professionals. Mm -hmm. So there's a very huge lack uh, between them, and uh, this lack seems to be uh, increasing uh, because there are a lot of possibilities to study data science at different levels, but all uh, different sectors are very far from dealing with data in their traditional teachings and so on. I don't know if I'm clear, but... Um, yes, you are very clear. And I'm gonna tell you uh, just a couple of quick uh, examples, stories that I, have, that, that I have been coming across uh, the last years. So we have uh, in Southampton Data Science Academy, we have big, big, big professional communities or prof professional groups or guilds or organizations of, of, of companies. Yeah? One of them, for example, they are the actuaries, the Institute uh, and Faculty of Actuaries. Actuaries are those who uh, kind of uh, calculate the risks in insurance and they, they do very uh, sophisticated uh, um, risk calculations and, and, and reports for deciding whether something should be insured or not, etc. So they, they have high numeracy levels and they can perform very sophisticated operations. However, um, we, uh, cohort after cohort, and they are big cohort, we realize that they are so specialized and so specific in their, math in their mathematical calculations that they can uh, that they can they they don't know very much about other tools around other tech, other methods around that could ease uh, very much that uh, their their job, but also they kind of lack the ability to uh, to to extract the value the value of the sheer amounts of data on which they are sitting on. Not only that, also they they kind of uh, uh, they kind of uh, of lack the the ability to know exactly what is what is there to be used and what can be used and 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 what is the best practice and and most ethical way to use this data and and to and to make their job easier. Their expertise uh, will never be uh, replaced by any algorithm. That's, uh, however, when, when they come to our course, um, most of them, they, uh, they state that, uh, that there were so many things that they, were, they had not been coming across because they are so focused on their job, on, on, on very specific uh, a very specific way of doing things that that the whole uh, the, the whole uh, data science and especially data literacy uh, training is is really useful for them so they develop a quite, quite a, a lot of uh, of competencies that they realize that they were needing it and 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 now they can talk data they can talk about data and they speak the language yeah but it is this, uh, so in industry, what we, uh, and that's got, that we are also training accountants, insurers, underwriters, etc. And it is kind of uh, speaking another language and they are learning this language and this culture. Yeah. So this is what we have noticed that it's, it is, uh, we are all uh, across all service industries and digital economy industries, we are all lacking kind of the, the culture and the language uh, and the and what others do and and it's very siloed every, every 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 profession is very kind of isolated from each other that's what we have noticed um has anyone um is anyone feeling similarly yes i would like to add, oh sorry sorry david please go ahead Oh, sorry. I was just the original question was around journalists. Yeah. 
Yeah, the original question was in journalists. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I was just going to one of the things that creates a lot of silos that we find is, is understanding what people's goals and objectives, performance measures, incentives, etc., are within their professions, and that causes quite a lot of, of of silos, particularly in areas like journalism, where you might see that you know the incentives are what gets you the highest number of clicks on a news article, right? You know, it, it's a different incentive from you know, using data to report something rigorously because it might turn out to be not so much of a news story that doesn't get you as many clicks, right? And it, it's 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 one of these interesting things how actually data is also driving interesting behaviors in the way that we're analyzing it and the way that we're then using that to drive different performance metrics, even for recommender engines. And we're seeing those kinds of things within media, obviously, that that recommend the popular stuff and we get into the echo chambers, don't we? Of if it's the same stuff that people are clicking on and 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 being aware that data is not just the, the input, but the output that we're getting as a result of people interacting with it is also driving this kind of cycle within a lot of professions. So it, it, I, I find that being aware of what the incentives are for the different profession, even if it's an actuary, you know, kind of understanding that and why potentially we haven't got a culture of needing to look into other stuff for innovative ways to do things as opposed to how do I improve that number <laughs> you know is, is a different way of thinking about a data culture yeah yeah I cannot agree more with that yeah so um, we have uh, we have made this a little bit longer and and we could uh, I could ask uh, to to finish this, we don't have that much, so much time left, but I would ask Davide, um, what are we doing in education to supply for these needs in general? Are we doing okay? Yeah, not, not, so, <laughs> not so much actually. This is, uh, I, let me report what uh, emerged from, um, yeah, this two project, the, the, the two projects that I mentioned before, um, the first phase of um, of the um, of both projects was to uh, study uh, in what is the uh, status in Europe uh, concerning the educational offer for um, the data literacy uh, data literacy subjects uh, and. <clears throat> We what emerged from uh, this research was that uh, the learning offer that we have uh, is uh, um, really uh, fragmentary in the sense that uh, uh, we you can uh, become a data science with a, a course of one week uh, or, or even in a semester in certain universities. So uh, it was very. Uh, different approach that the universities and but also companies. I mean, there are some uh, data uh, related. Let me say data related uh, courses um, offered also by um, very uh, important uh, players in in the IT domain. Uh, but what uh, this is also uh, one thing related to what. Uh, we uh, we are saying we say before I mean that uh, um, when we uh, when it comes to data literacy we are not only referring to very uh, specific uh, data uh, competencies or data science competencies as we know I mean the even artificial intelligence or statistical analysis or other other things like that. But uh, um, when we talk about um, data literacy, uh, what emerged also from our uh, from from this research from our research and, and the projects was that uh, um, data literacy concerns also to uh, other soft skills that are needed to 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 work with data. That it means also the um, storytelling, for instance, or the critical thinking. Or uh, this is also an aspect that is requested by um, many um, business. Um, business enterprises uh, and for instance uh, we, we have uh, in, in the projects that uh, I coordinated we have uh, uh, several uh, SMEs that have been involved uh, both as partner or as contributor 
and uh, uh, we say we, we, we saw that uh, uh, in in the enterprise domain, um, not not always what they need is uh, uh, experts in uh, the analysis of data, but sometimes they need also expert with data visualization or per persons that are able to communicate data. I mean to communicate a story through uh, through data that this uh, um, to certain extent even more relevant than just analyzing data that, but it's another story I mean it, 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 I, I'm not saying that uh, uh, analyzing data is not uh, uh, necessary because it, it's important in a very wide range of uh, of domains but uh, um, for many enterprises or especially for the SMEs, I mean, they what they need is to uh, take advantage from data, but even without having a uh, master in uh, uh, in the <clears throat> uh, a master in the uh, in the data science uh, specifically. For this for these reasons, I think that the data literacy, I mean, deserve to have uh, a specific area in the educational uh, sector. It might be is not only. Um, uh, needed in the scientific and technological uh, departments, but uh, I think that also the other faculties, also the humanities, these are lots of uh, data literacy uh, competencies uh, to, um, to to close the gap with the requests from the from the enterprises world. But yeah, okay, I, I think that I talk a lot. <laughs> no, that's good, and I would say not only for not only educate. Uh, uh, data literacy com uh, competencies for for succeeding at work but also to succeed as a as a citizen yeah and to uh, and and to to live with with others in the current data driven society and this is also a kind of a skill for not only for work but for life and it's uh, an education is is for a, a, it's not only the higher education it it it's it, it, it it has to be this data literacy education has to arrive to kind of everyone, to all sorts of people and and all sorts of profiles and underserved communities, etc. And this is uh, um, uh, Christoph's uh, Christoph's paper, who is going to uh, to to present now. Probably it, it has uh, he, uh, Christoph has something to say about it. So Chris. Um, Christopher, why don't you uh, proceed to present your paper? It's we haven't run five minutes over, so you can uh, finish five minutes later, actually. Yeah, and we can uh, we can run over a little bit. We have uh, we have some leeway for that. So um, uh, I give you the floor. Yes, thank you. So I hope you can see uh, one of my screens. Yes. Yes. We can see it perfectly, yeah. Fantastic. Um, so, no, no, thank you. And indeed, uh, so, uh, first of all, a uh, quick introduction, uh, I get well, of the team. Uh, so this paper was co-authored with the team behind this project, uh, Laura Grehan, Mairead Hurley, Anne Kearns, and Kiran O'Neill. Um, you can see many a name are Irish. I'm the only uh, blow-in of... Uh, the group. Um, and indeed, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about how we wanted to reach communities that not only uh, did not benefit from opportunities to learn or hone their data literacy skills, but especially those communities that we know didn't really have those opportunities. So uh, under, uh, um, well, communities of uh, socio-economic, uh, economical um, disadvantaged backgrounds. Now, first slide, whoops, it doesn't seem to, now it does. This is just spiel I have to present. It was funded by SFI, uh, graciously funded by SFI, and those are all the other universities involved in that, Trinity College Dublin and UCD uh, Dublin. Um, but what is the LIDA? So we've presented the LIDA project last year at the workshop. And at the time of, uh, uh, at the time of that workshop, uh, we, the paper got accepted and we just finished our 
uh, first workshop, uh, which went quite well. And so here we wanted to um, report on the things that we experienced, the lessons learned, um, and especially focus on the challenges, especially with respect to the communities that we wanted to reach. Now, uh, for those uh, that were uh, present, a brief reminder uh, for those who were not present. Well, in this project, which is, uh, it, 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 this project was driven by co-creation. What that means that we invited to community, uh, community liaisons or people that uh, fit our targeted audience, and they drove in a way the design of the workshop. So I had my idea, preconceived idea of what, it, what, I, what I wanted to look like. I could have shelved that. So they decided we needed another format. Um, uh, and for all the right reasons, of course, and after two sessions of co-creation, we came up with a workshop that we piloted. Uh, we took the comments into account, and then we were able to have eight workshops uh, the past year. And we just had the ninth one yesterday. Uh, obviously, we couldn't report on that uh, whilst writing the paper. So the workshops were called debunked. So even though the project was called Dalida, it didn't have the same ring to it Okay, so the, we, we needed to rename the workshop and we decided to, uh, because data literacy can be applied in many a domain. So in order to have the topic as accessible as possible through co-creation, we figured out, okay, let's apply it to fake news and memes. And in order to make it more appealing to the audience, which, uh, uh, which do not necessarily have the education that we, um, well, they, they're not trained in those, uh, in data literacy. We had two aspects. One was something more pertaining to Ireland so that they, it could resonate with them. So the misrepresentation of Irish slave history uh, on social media. And then there were a set of activities that where we tried to discuss data literacy and hone some skills or allude to some more, uh, or describe some more, um, other aspects of, uh, of that in other activities. So apply to social media in a particular domain and then apply it with examples in other domains as well as to make it um, well-rounded and as accessible as possible. If you have any questions on the format or the topic of the format, happy to uh, explain that later on. So as I said, we had our last session yesterday and what am I going to tell you? Well, um, I'm going to, describe the final format of this particular course. It's not a course, it's a seminar to introduce people to the concept of data literacy, uh, the role of education and public engagement training in that project, the challenges and the lessons learned, and of course, report some of the things that people told us through participant evaluations. The workshop structure, um, key here was to keep it accessible, not too difficult, not too boring, um, also pique their interest. It sounds, it, it sounds a lot more easy than it is. So we have chosen to uh, take examples from Irish history, COVID-19, because that was quite topical at the time, but we were also informed not to choose other topics because they might have been too controversial or too sensitive. Um, let's say racism. Voila, uh, and to keep it as accessible as possible. Now we were during uh, we were we we were in, on lockdown, so we had to keep it short. Um, but how do we get as much out of it? And through the co-creation activity and the pilot, uh, we finally came up with the following structure. There was some pre uh, preparatory work. People had to had a description to read with an example, so that they really knew what they were getting into. And they had a couple of examples that they could look at because we were going to discuss those examples. So that was the homework, but it was not obligatory. Then we described in short, what is data literacy and how can it help us arm ourselves against mis and disinformation on the web. And then Professor O'Neill took over and started talking about a case 
misrepresentation of Irish slave history on social media to set the scene. And we first start, why do people want to share myths and disinformation? Why do people want to share disinformation? And we had then one activity where we talked about that and where we started to touch upon the fact, but how can we avoid this? And that introduces the topic uh, more concretely about data literacy. We came, come back, uh, tup, tup, setting the scene. Oh, apologies. So yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, tup, tup. Between these two, I forgot to add a part, I think. There was then another presentation of uh, Professor O'Neill where he basically explained what the truth is. What is Irish, what, what, is, the, what is the relationship between slave, slaves and Ireland in history? What has happened? And it turned out to be quite nuanced and not at all what to expect, which then went into uh, the final activity of having exercises where people were allowed to discuss what is wrong with something, how would you solve it? And then that led to discussions. This is the goal of the workshop, people discussing about the subject matter and afterwards being more aware where what they can train or what they should, if they're interested, uh, interested in, what they should hone or uh, look up in order to uh, arm oneself a bit better. After that, there was a wrap up. And in the wrap up, uh, we just, we go, we explain the whole structure of the format, introducing the concept, introducing the concept into a particular application domain. Then how can we arm our, ourselves? And uh, if any questions were left unanswered, we uh, tried to address those. And at the end, there's a post follow-up workshop. We have seen that some questions cannot be answered or some communities requested more information, more pointers and so forth. So after the workshop, a couple of days later, we sent on a bunch of information, the questions that were not un unanswered and those resources. I will now get to the meat of it. Um, so the role of the EPE team is to uh, inspire and help or facilitate uh, the public to engage with research. And within Ireland and SFI funded project, there's also a requirement that every researcher on their payroll has to participate in EPE activities. It's a bit difficult because traditionally it's something that is imposed. We have money, you are paid on that money, you have to do this. So the incentives were not quite right. But they started seeing that if researchers started driving such projects and you get credit for that, um, that might lend to uh, a different kind of EPE activity. People like myself are eager to create something for the community and find people to do so. So that switched a bit, the little, uh, little bit the mentality and we're now developing training material to help people establish their own projects rather than EPE teams trying to distill projects from the work of researchers. And it seems to work well. During the project, we had faced, we have, we have been faced with, a new, with quite a, uh, with numerous challenges, a lot of them pertaining to COVID-19 so we had the Zoom fatigue. We cannot, initially they were planned to um, take place a whole day with a nice big lunch in between. People like to show up for lunch. So that was one way to get those communities to, uh, to us. That didn't happen because of the two lockdowns. Uh, we had many no-shows because we kept the uh, event free. We thought about charging uh, about the event, knowing that the no-show rate would probably decrease, but even asking five euros might have been a obstacle for underprivileged communities. And we had people dropping in late, dropping out, and something that really annoyed me, whenever there was a workshop, uh, Zoom had an update, and hence we had a delay, uh, and people uh, were not on time. 
So the altered format was okay. So to keep it short, even though many, well, some uh, uh, people did express that they wanted to cover a lot more. But after the event, after one hour, two hours of a Zoom meeting, they were exhausted, especially when you partook in that. We tried online advertising to recruit more people, and that had little to no impact. So that's, that's wasted. And uh, as I said, we wanted to keep the workshops free. Another thing that we noticed is uh, compared to other similar events, not on data literacy, people had a difficulty keeping their agenda free. They, they just said, sorry, have something else to do and they drop off. The biggest challenge, however, was reaching our intended audience, the people of underprivileged backgrounds. And uh, that's why I think it warrants a separate discussion. It is also related to COVID-19. But those people uh, were almost not reached because why? They have no access to computers. In Ireland, certain areas do not have decent uh, infrastructure. So they don't have broadband or decent broadband. So can, they cannot participate. They have families. There are many of things that became an obstacle to them. So we tried liaising with community lia uh, liaisons. So those are people close to the community. They might be a community stand, uh, a center. They might be uh, a, tr a soccer trainer close to an area of, uh, of youth and whatnot. But uh, they didn't work out either. Sometimes it, they had to really push people and try. So what they did was trying to liaise with them what would work best, what day, what time, when, and commit to that. Uh, otherwise, it was incredibly difficult. Um, the, the medium that seemed to work the best was leaflets. So we go to a library, we drop the paper, there's an event happening. If you're interested, sign up for it. Um, during the workshops, when they were there, Obviously, we had to cancel a couple of workshops. We held eight workshops instead of five. The initially, we initially planned five. We did a lot more, uh, but some had to be canceled because there were too little uh, participants showing up and then they were invited to another workshop. So in all in all, we were quite pleased with the number of workshops. But one uh, other challenges include participants questioning facts. So even though we, uh, we applied it to the Irish slave meme, uh, which is known not to be true. Uh, we had incidents where people said, no, it happened. And they started questioning history. Now, that is in itself, that is not really an issue if you have the domain expert there to rebuttal. But there have been instances where neither Professor Kiran O'Neill nor, uh, nor I were present. So there was no authority between quotes, being able to nuance or provide an answer, et cetera. And the people who facilitated the workshop were shaken. And because of that, their authority might be questioned. So uh, we learned about that. So we have to take into account for the next series of workshops of a similar type, um, the anticipation of domain experts not necessarily be there and ask the domain experts, what could they question? And if they question something, what could we say or how can we uh, um, how can we respond adequately to that? Um, but it is, it is, it is kind of um, awkward when you're faced with that and you don't know how to uh, respond. The, for the eight workshops, we asked uh, uh, before the workshop and after the workshop, we asked them to fill in questionnaires. And of those uh, questionnaires that were filled in, 30 were taken into account because they were completed. Um, positive, the, they appreciated the content, the speakers, the facilitators, and 80% of them reported learning something new. Now, we cannot discern whether it was on statistical data literacy or on the meme that we cannot tease out. Uh, the community liaisons, whenever we dealt with a person that representing a group, they reported back that they were a success. 
so the indirect feedback seemed to be uh, very uh, uh, great as well. They also appreciated that we applied data literacy uh, to a domain, and uh, some of them said it's good that you mixed it up with something else in order to make it accessible. The negative, um, only two people reported meeting people with different views. Now that said, that's low. We, were, we would like to have had more, um, not fights, but differing opinions during the discussions. That doesn't mean that there haven't been more. It's only of the 30 respondents, only two reported that, but I believe I think there might have been more because we, during the workshops, we saw that there were opposing views. Some found the misinformation surrounding the Irish slave meme more memorable. Others found the more statistical examples more memorable. Now, is that a bad thing? Maybe. I tend to argue that the mixed approach at least ensured us that people with differing interests were reached. As for the online format, People were divided. Some think it was. Some people think it was okay. Others would have preferred longer format, but without Zoom. So overall, we do think that the workshop was a success, especially when we consider the evaluation of participants. The challenge was actually reaching our intended audience of underprivileged uh, uh, people of underprivileged bank, uh, backgrounds. We didn't achieve, we didn't reach those in the numbers that we wanted. We don't have, we don't have concrete figures because it's quite sensitive to ask people, what's your background? Uh, but, and we will foresee backup and uh, training for facilitators when domain experts are not present. Why? We want to repurpose this workshop. I have left uh, that institution people will move, but the material has been developed and we hope to repurpose that material uh, for, the next, uh, for the next year. I presume, aha, uh, that was just, that's not in the paper, but personally, co-creation, uh, for me, that was quite, uh, quite, quite difficult. That means that I had to let go. Uh, I like to be in control. And I have had to learn not to do that, which was an interesting experience for me. But the future work, hopefully, uh, well, hopefully it will happen, but we are going to finish up, polish up the material, make it a little bit more sexy, and then make it available to the wider public uh, for reuse. Um, and also think of ways to organize other instances of the debunked workshop with or without me. So I hope that with this presentation, I've given you a glimpse of a initiative to reach people that are not necessarily professionals in industry, nor people in higher education. We wanted to reach people who had never had, who never had the opportunity to become aware of these things. Just a, a quick side note, I think two years ago, um, the Irish public administration, those responsible for education, have uh, submitted new proposals for secondary schools in which they have included some digital literacy skills and some ICT skills. So this is great. Um, now, more details on that I do not have on me. Okay, uh, thank you, Christoph. So we are uh, some six minutes beyond schedule, but we are going to use the buffer of the of the break if if you're okay with that. And I I have a couple of questions, but I'm going to wait for, but I'm going to prioritize other people's questions. Um, so, yeah, are there any questions here for for Christoph? I also have to say that I I'm having connection problems here at the university, so I I need to check if you are hearing me well right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I need you. So I have a yeah I have just received a message of unstable connection. 
So if I break up, um, yeah, you will uh, have to let me know or go on without me. So any, so there are, are there any questions then, or can I ask myself? Good. I do yours, and maybe I will add some at the end. Okay. Yeah. No. Mine is mine is short and sharp. So I agree very much that uh, that data literacy has to be um, served to underserved uh, uh, communities, and the, it comes with very many uh, challenges. You have to choose the topic very well. For example, you have to make it interesting, interesting enough, and you. Uh, and you have to, um, and 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 you have and you have to uh, make it accessible for everyone. So, could you, among all those uh, all those uh, um, uh, points that you have made, could you give me two big do's and two big don'ts when trying to run? This kind of uh, this this kind of, of workshops, which by the way, I think the workshop approach is the it's it's one of the most uh, suitable for this kind of purposes. So two big do's and two big don'ts. Um, okay, I will actually some uh, something that the EPE training has taught me is don't stick to the schedule. It's better for people to talk about the topic and maybe not answer all the questions, but have them engage and talk about it and vent. And I have goosebumps because it, the best workshops were those where people are just having a chat and having a back and forth and talking about data literacy, the dangers, might, where they might have seen things. And then we just said, look, here's an example or here's a resource. So don't stick to the format if people that are not trained in this start talking about it and become more aware and they say at the end of the thing i have learned something we've done our job even though we have not covered anything um, so that would be a do don't stick to the format <laughs> uh, a i think that's a very big do i cannot come up with another one or a do would be listen to the community uh, they told me don't use racism so I had, I had found examples with statistics to show how be things could be biased. But then the community told us this is way too controversial as a topic. Don't include that. You, you might miss the point. Uh, so listen to the, the community. The don't is, uh, is to try to rebuttal. Uh, as we had with that case, don't question their truth. It will only create a toxic environment. It is very awkward, but try to say, we'll come back to you after the <laughs> workshop. Uh, Fair enough. Um, but th that was specific to our format. So don't go against the grain and, uh, and try to provide them information afterwards. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's very useful. That's very useful, uh, uh, Christoph, especially in data, uh, when talking about data with, with diverse audiences, yeah? So, um, I and I'm going to follow your advice as well right here, and I'm not going to be very strict with the schedule, and, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, ask uh, Davide if you want to keep going with the question or, or we moved with David. Yep. What do you think, David? Very quick question. I mean, I think that uh, because I, I, I found the, very interesting the workshop that uh, Christoph presented, I was just wondering if uh, the participants work in group during the workshop and if they produce something at the end. I mean, I don't know, a presentation, slides or whatever. Yeah. You, you are absolutely right. That was presented last year, but I forgot to mention that. So they are divided into groups whenever the group was sufficiently big. They, each uh, group discusses a couple of things and a scribe writes down the main points. And then in the main group, the scribes reported back. And it was quite interesting to see how different groups had different discussions or different insights that they wanted to share. All of that is shared. And from time to time, ADAPT would go through those documents and write something about that or disseminate those. 
but so there's a, a, there are traces of the discussions that were held. So, and again, we had, we had a format, the scribes were there, but when they went on tangents, they had the instruction, write down the tangents, even though they fit, do not fit into the boxes. Um, and that, that was quite fun. Nice one. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, th well, thanks a lot uh, for, for the presentation and the answers to the questions and the discussion. And I think uh, without further ado, we, we can move to the Open Data Institute and their, uh, and their nice programs, which I must say I have had the privilege to attend, but David will tell us about it, yeah? Cool, thanks very much, Romel. I think Callum, are you driving? There we go, look at that, seamless. Um, so thanks for, this is this is a great privilege for me. It's good to be back at a web conference. I think this is the first one I've done since 2016, believe it or not. So um, thank you very much for putting this workshop um, together. Um, wrong way around, Callum. Giving away the secrets there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have the other screen. Um, so yeah, as, as, as mentioned, I'll, I'll let Callum try and fix that. Do you want me to do it, Callum? Yeah, if you could, I'm not sure exactly what's happening here. Sorry, Dave. <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. I'll get it. Hang on. Uh, slide show. Set up that one. Mm -hmm. No, not that one. Uh, God, seamless. Never stick to the agenda. Hey, let's take that as a as a. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Right, let's start again. Let's go with this. Got it. All right. Okay. Um, so yeah, thanks very much for that. Um, so uh, what we're going to present in this piece of work, and I'm going to add a little bit of interaction to it because we're this size of group, so we may as well because we've got, got like a half hour slot, but I don't want to take it all entirely out without a little bit of interaction in it. So um, within this um, work, we did it. We've been doing a piece of research around data literacy. What is it? How do you communicate it to people? How do you make people understand it best? How do you make people understand what the mix of skills that are required within it? Uh, how do you might you benchmark it with the organizations and how might you teach it as a result? So how does it change curricula? So we've got a hell of a lot to cover. So I've, I've got to say thanks first to obviously Callum, but we've also got people who are not here today. Um, Emily Forrest, who is currently on kind of maternity, having a second child, so she's not here today. Um, and Phil Greenwood from Glaxis as well, who's been helping us out with some thoughts around how you actually might go about teaching and assessing data literacy through practical activities, which is something that I will touch on. Um, so we've got four main things that we'll step through within this and I'll hand over to Callum for the first one, which is um, if we started off and we have been doing quite a lot of kind of looking at how people define data literacy, both across academia, pu uh, public sector um, and in the private sector as well. What's the differences between them? Where are we getting some overlap? Who's more advanced and why in different areas? So I'll let Callum speak towards that. Um, then we've been trying to, we, we work a lot with public sector and with private sector. So what are the kind of frameworks that appeal in those sectors? How do we complement what's already out there uh, in order to boost the kind of awareness of data literacy and also the uptake of it within organizations and government? Um, and then organizations ask us kind of like, well, where are we currently? How do we benchmark? That is a typical question you get asked, right? So we started thinking about, well, how might you do that? And we've created a, a kind of a scale based upon the OECD framework for benchmarking adult data, adult literacy levels. So we'll present that to you. And then um, Callum will then talk about the, we did a survey of that, kind of a self-assessment of where people think they're at. And, and we've got some results of that that we also present that are in the, the, the long paper. Um, and then we'll talk a little little bit about um, and next steps as well. Where are we now? What are the challenges that we're facing and kind of what are we going to try and do next within this area? So I think with that, I'm handing over to Callum to talk about the definitions. Yeah, no, brilliant. Thanks so much, Dave, uh, particularly for helping out last minute there with uh, running the slides. So that's great. Uh, glad that we're actually back on track now and I'll try and stick to time with this. But so as you'll see at the top of there, how do you define data literacy? And uh, it's a good question that doesn't have a simple answer, as was kind of being alluded to in the initial discussions that we had at the roundtable. 
So uh, we decided to look at this question at the beginning of the paper, as well as some of the varying definitions that are out there of data literacy. And this kind of curiosity was born out of our observations that, uh, as also discussed earlier on, uh, there's many courses and solutions out there to data literacy, which are still relatively uh, or rather heavily focused on what we might consider data skills rather than data literacy per se. So that's not to say that this is entirely incorrect, uh, but more just to actually appreciate that there's more to data literacy than just the improvement of data skills themselves. So um, through the review of uh, the many different definitions, uh, we encountered some recurring themes and trends. Uh, the first, uh, as you'll see there, is that it's, there are some more comprehensive de definitions within certain sectors, particularly within academia than in others. And this is not necessarily to criticize other sectors for not being as comp comprehensive, but it perhaps reflects that, it, um, that some of these narrower uh, use of definitions uh, are done for pr uh, purposes of specific applications uh, within, say, the public sector or in industry. Um, so whether it's like a target of uh, upskilling a certain number of civil servants, etc. Anyway, uh, another sort of a trend that emerged as well, um, or actually one uh, perspective that we found um, added really uh, constructively to this discussion around data literacy was actually drawn from Christoph's uh, paper from last year, uh, and the focus on both the active and passive elements of data literacy, which is a real nice succinct way uh, or terminology, um, which we found useful, particularly for articulating some of the softer and behavioral aspects that we feel are necessary and complementary to the skills that are often heavily leaned upon uh, when talking about data literacy in some other contexts. Uh, that being said, uh, there was also a consideration of um, uh, that while there is this con consideration of passive elements of data literacy, it's still primarily within academic discussions. Uh, this reflects the continued emphasis and definitions of data literacy within the public and private sector, primarily through the lens of data skills, as reflected in uh, a, a recent report by uh, my co-presenter here, Dave, um, and some of our other colleagues at the ODI on the overemphasis of practical data skills within the UK's national data strategy. Um, if we could maybe jump on to the next slide. Thank you very much. So what we have here is a quote from uh, one of our co-founders uh, at the Open Data Institute, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, and this really kind of encouraged us to think about uh, when we are dealing with data literacy, it's key to increase knowledge on, uh, well, both uh, knowledge and skills, so both sides of the aisle, really. Um, this is kind of reflected in the quote that you can see here, and what it really gets at is it's not just about having the skills to be able to get the data out there necessarily, but also being able to understand how to make it comprehensible for the uh, intended audience as well. Uh, if we're not doing that, then we're not doing it right. Um, so yeah, on this basis, training everyone in data science, uh, as is uh, been kind of the favored or one of the favored uh, modes uh, until now, can actually serve to increase uh, the digital divide and make uh, situations worse. Sorry, Dave, on to you. Thanks very much, Gavin. So um, I just thought we, on that point of referencing Christoph and the previous point, actually referenced that we've been doing some workshops and trying to make people think about what data literacy is. And, and while we in Christoph's work, he didn't ta tackle racism and that kind of stuff, right? Um, interesting, we, we've been running some workshops um, and at the beginning of the workshop, we actually set people this question. Okay, now this is an interesting question. Does anyone want to suggest back what skills and competencies might be needed? Maybe in chat, why don't we collect a couple quickly? quickly. Where would you start? What skills or competencies would you think an organisation requires to demonstrate its commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion? Just thought we'd break it up a little bit with a little bit of thought experiment on this yourselves. Mm, yeah. Mm. <laughs> okay, let's have a top, top one from each person in chat. Shall we do that? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to try and write something. Uh, yeah, go for it. So, so we can, you can see that while you're doing that and thinking about it, I'll just chat about how we would normally do this. So setting this at the beginning of a workshop, like Christoph said, if you've got a big enough group, we would normally divide the group into different uh, breakout rooms and give them a chance to talk this through and come up with some ideas on a whiteboard. 
um, whether that be Zoom or wherever, it doesn't really matter. Um, and what we're kind of looking for here is, is what the kind of things that people are su suggesting, what kind of skills that they're going towards. And the kind of things that we see, which is quite interesting, I'm just giving people time to, to type in an idea so that we've got a little bit of an idea from this group of what we think. <laughs> And then I'll, I'll, I'll kind of suggest where we go with ours. So publishing a kind of memorandum from, yeah, publishing data about wages and demographics. Yeah, Christoph, okay, great, I like that. Okay, anyone else wanna come in on the... What we kind of see on this um, is that if I split the group into people who, I, we're, we're, before we have the workshop, we ask people what their roles are within an organization. Okay, now we use this to actually split the group into those people who are more data focused and those people who aren't. Okay, and then what we see is we see what the differences are between the two groups. The data focused people might talk about collecting data, publishing data, analyzing data, communicating with data. They'll use a lot of word data when it comes to collecting. Okay, yeah, proven by the data. Andrews, thank you for that. Brilliant. That's data people. This is what data people come up with, right? What other skills do you need when it comes to doing that? And actually, this is where literacy comes in, because if you're thinking about DEI, well, then we need to think critically about well, what data do we actually need to collect? Is it actually possible to measure DEI? Is there a definition of what the categories are when you're measuring diversity? And will you insult everybody by not including them in those categories? And, and it's kind of you, when you start to realize that it's a bit like your Irish history example, it's a bit more complex than you think it is. And thus you need ideas of like, how do we think critically about this? Could we even collect diversity data? And would it be you know ethically unacceptable morally unacceptable for some people for us to even ask them for it <laughs> you know and so we get into that realm of strategic thinking around is is data going to help solve the problem or is data going to make it worse yeah are we actually going to only emphasize a bias if we choose a certain amount of categories we want to collect data about are those the only categories we're interested in and you get into that and this is where that kind of soft and, pass and passive skill really conflicts with the active and so when we do this in workshops and and, and i'm adding this because it what, on the back of christoph's excellent talk was was kind of when we do this on workshops it kind of makes the data people think about governance privacy and ethics and it makes the people who think about governance and ethics think carefully about the data which is really interesting when it comes to data literacy and the impact that it can have and so what i'll do is i'll hand back to callum to talk a little bit about how that's reflected in the definitions callum yeah, thanks, Dave. I hope that was a nice little different interjection to get everyone back engaged and everything. But so we're heading back to the paper now, and then this is essentially what you can see here. This is a bit of a table that um, we've put together, which sort of succinctly tries to capture the key areas of focus for uh, the, some of uh, uh, selected texts uh, that um, inform the paper's literature review. So when we were revisiting these, we drew out some of these key areas in, the def in their definitions that they had. Uh, this should obviously be caveated by acknowledging that there's a variety of different terms and language that were used however those noted here the four that we've got the practical skills creative skills creative critical thinking and ethics were sort of present throughout uh, all to varying degrees. Just for a very quick sort of definition of my definitions, um, that in the practical skills for, uh, for this for the purpose of this table, this includes skills such as accessing and managing data, the creative skills is around communication and presentation, uh, critical thinking is uh, inclusive of uh, terms such as uh, analysing and critically assessing, uh, and ethics was specifically singled out as it appeared quite regularly in, uh, well, at least in three of these sources, namely uh, under some variant of ethical use of data. Um, so essentially just this table evidence is again that there's different areas of focus within the definitions. It's by no means a, a consolidated uh, term. Um, so to that extent, uh, it's important that authors are mindful of the context in which it's actually being used, the emphasis that is placed on the various elements um, as within these, um, there was indeed mention of other parts, uh, but to somewhat lesser extent. Um, so this just essentially reflects the fact that some of the definitions used by the authors were contextual in themselves and also subject to specific orientation as well. Um, one last little bit before I hand back over to Dave actually is um, you'll see at the bottom there that we've uh, got a definition from DCMS, that's the UK's D Department for Digital Culture and Media and Sport. Um, so they've actually lifted theirs from Colte there. Uh, 
Um, uh, so can't necessarily credit them fully with it. Uh, and it's perhaps maybe a little bit uh, um, uh, flattering uh, because what we find from what the definition they actually used where they included or included emphasis on practical skills and critical thinking and ethics, then in practice, what we're actually seeing in uh, from um, the UK government and their approach, not just within DCMS, but across the government entirely, is that there's still this very much heavy uh, sort of equation or equivalence of data literacy and data skills, which then in practice sees uh, hard skills being focused on. Um, back to Dave. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, and we've got a, a, a recent paper out that we've actually published, which has got a lot more of that UK government focus in it, where we actually did some analysis of kind of some courses that are available, uh, different definitions across departments, etc. So that, for the purposes of this, we're at a world co worldwide conference, but there is also another much longer in-depth study of the UK that you can also access through the um, materials on our own website. Um, so going after that, then what's, what's our definition of data literacy? How do we view data literacy? Well, to take inspiration for this one, I'm going to quote another great hero of mine that I used to work with, the former ODI Vice President, Dr. Jenny Tennyson. Um, and she talks about, um, or did talk about literacy in the same way that I'm passionate about, which is, you may have studied at school language and literature as two independent subjects. You do in the UK with English, where language is almost the equivalent akin to the skills, the putting the words together to form sentences, et cetera, in language, uh, whether that be written or spoken, that's the study of language. It's akin to the skills. Um, the study of literature, on the other hand, is, is, is the opposite. It's the study of how other people use it and what impact it has and why they're choosing to use it in that way. So if you're thinking you're studying you know, different poets or or Shakespeare, you know, you're, you're studying kind of like the way that they use it, what impact it has, what's influenced them, that's the study of literature. Um, and so we're thinking about data literacy as being akin to that. And it's kind of the looking and the critical thinking about how others, why others are collecting certain parts of data, what are they trying, wanting to do with that? What effect might that have on the overall result? Why are they communicating it in a certain way? What are they trying to achieve? How is that trying to influence me? All of these things are very much kind of literature based um, outcomes. And so um, our own definition focuses very much about the, the critical thinking about data in different contexts and examine the impact of different approaches around data collection, use and sharing, if I'm going to expand on this a little bit. Um, and so you can start to define what I think is useful is when it comes to training programs, you know, start to define some of the literacy skills, knowledge, you know, the kind of learning outcomes that you want people to see, you know, things like interpreting a, vis a visualization, not creating one, like interpreting them. What does this mean? What does it say to you? How do you start evaluating the limitations of data, right? You know, how do you start understanding the effect that bias or the way the data is collected might have on the various different results? You know, how do you, you know, start off with a simple thing like counting? I love that. You know, like you show people a picture of a field at this time, a farmer's field at this time of year with some sheep in it and, and ask them to count the number of sheep and be careful with lambs. When does lamb become a sheep? You know, these kinds of things is, you know, how do you evaluate the limitations of even counting? We know from COVID, you know, that people are more aware now that we can't compare which countries have the least number of deaths because it's not possible, right? And people are getting more literate to some of these things about the limitations of the, of the ways that data can be used. You know, and then getting towards that analysis of impact of data on a, on a project or on a community. And I really like, the, you know, Christoph talking about the, you know, the, von, you know, the, the more... Um, socially deprived demographics, like, let's think about those as communities and then the impact that data has on those. So in order to help people think about this, we created the probably badly named now data skills framework. Okay, you know, we created this a few years ago when skills was the word and literacy was kind of down here somewhere, right? This is the third data literacy workshop. It's climbing, it's good. Um, but, you know, what we realized in that time was actually this is more about literacy um, and, and, and again, emphasizing the, the balance of skills that's required to get the most out of data. Now, down the right hand side of this, you can kind of see your typical data skills. All right. Just just proceed down the right hand side and you'll see it's all there. Yeah. The balance is then if it's not balanced with the other stuff on the left hand side in a, in a learning outcome, in a course. You know, you can't say let's have a separate course to talk about governance from um, applying statistics to 
DEI data. You know, you need to talk about both at the same time. Yeah. Um, and this is the real scope to what data literacy teaching might involve is how do we balance these so that we're always doing both at the same time within a program. Yeah. And, and again, you can think about it as the foundations are really at the top of this diagram. You know, the, the you, what value does data create? How do we standardize it, get hold of it? What limitations does it have? So we're governing its access at the same time. Who can have access to it? What kind of things can it be eventually used for as we go down? And then when you get to the usage down further down towards the bottom of this, uh, you get towards the, well, when are we, what are we going to do with the data? How do we apply statistics? How do we then measure the success against the community? What might be the positive and negative impacts of, of this use of the data? How do we manage those? What kind of policy changes might this lead to? Yeah, so again, you've got that balance that you need to focus on all the way down. And when it gets one-sided, that's when we start to see unethical uses of data. You know, tr trouble in lies here. Here be dragons, okay? Um, down at the bottom right without some of the top left or at least quite a lot of the left-hand side. And so that's where we use that in the workshops to say to people, what did you cover in your discussion about DEI? Tick off the hexes that you covered as fundamental skills for your, your conversation about DEI. What did you miss? Are you more left-hand side or right-hand side? So what's missing? OK, and if we've got the two groups, sometimes that ends up being, well, we were all on this side and had nothing about that side. Yeah. So how do we get the balance of skills right um, in order to um, get towards literacy and that critical thinking? Um, brief history on the framework. I'll try and keep this as brief as possible. We did a couple of projects, one called the European Data Science Academy that we were involved in that involved a hell of a lot of interviews around what are the skills that are needed in data science. That was when data science was hot. We're talking a few number of years ago now. But it was even interesting at this point that managers were consistently optimistic about their team skills and the team members themselves going, yeah, we can do whatever we want with data, analyze it and get loads of stuff out of it. And then, but the data analysis, uh, analysis, you know, when we talked to them, it was more about, yeah, well, I can do whatever I like with data, but the application is the problem, the domain level context. The, the, that's the critical skill that's missing a lot. It's that how does this apply to us? You know, the, the critical thinking was, was certainly top of what people wanted in terms of skills, even within a data science project. You know, at this particular time, programming was not the hot thing. Um, and then we also looked at, at what level is data literacy knowledge required? And we did a project called the Open Data Education Project, which was an Erasmus Plus um, with, with a number of other institutions. Um, and we started asking people, what are the skills that you actually need? And we started asking people who aren't in, in we started people asking people from different backgrounds, different domains. And it wasn't really surprising that looking at the EQF frameworks, there's a real gap in training actually between compulsory education and further education. Yeah. Um, so because a lot of people are coming from backgrounds where their maths and statistics and data knowledge stopped at maths at GCSE compulsory level or whatever it's called these days. OK, you know, that EQF level three. And yet within organisations and businesses, they're being subjected to level five, six and seven programmes from universities, which is not a problem. Those programmes are really good, but there's a gap here that we're seeing across the market with boosting the fundamental data literacy. Of, of adults across society. So I was really pleased, Christoph, to hear about your target audiences. You know, the differences there, you know, in how do we reach those people effectively with the right programs? So, you know, thinking about that, what kind of solutions can we offer? And we always think about at ODI around, you know, stuff that connects to people, again, that problem-based learning approach. Again, Christoph, you've mentioned this, and it's really good to see it happening more and more. And so all of our programs, as Manuel knows, from the experience of working with SDSA, very much focus on a problem-based learning approach. Um, trying to connect people to a problem, uh, even if it's diversity, emergency services, et cetera. Everything, something that people know worldwide that they can really get passionate about and, uh, and, and increase their data literacy um, as a result. And we, so we've kind of moved on from here, though, to go, you know, using the framework still, but looking at how do we benchmark literacy? Can we say to people, where are you at and where are the next stages? And it's kind of an interesting point that we've got to looking at the OECD adult data literacy level, uh, sorry, OECD adult literacy levels. I don't know if people have seen these before, but they're generally the ways of talking about how literate the population is in terms of what they're capable of. Um, 
And so I did a very basic thing, I'll be honest with you, which was to take those and try and introduce the word data into them as much as possible. OK, kind of like where does data go in these to create what would be the equivalent for adult data literacy um, levels? And so these are the, the five, uh, the six from zero to five. Um, and the OECD emphasizes within theirs that level three is the level that you should get to to lead a healthy life. So they're talking about being able to manage bills, taxes, credit cards, you know, those kinds of things that you need to be able to live a healthy life as an adult. And so we, we tried to create a similar mapping to what's the level of data and literacy that people would need to live a healthy life in data when it's being thrown at you every single day in the media, the press and from every other angle, especially with things like COVID. Um, and, and so we, we put this we put this together. We, we, it's a useful guide, but we wanted to find out well what would happen if we asked people what they think their data literacy level was. Q Callum. Thank you, Dave. Um, so the next slide will be popping up shortly, I think. But then there we go. So uh, for the purpose of uh, the paper as well, we undertook the survey as mentioned uh, to try and really put the ODI data literacy levels in, uh, try them out in practice. Uh, so through conducting the survey, we were hoping to answer two questions that we've got up here, which was uh, firstly, how do people identify with the skills framework that you've just been shown? Um, and also how suitable is self-assessment uh, for, for the benchmarking of data literacy? Um, we're aware as well that there's numerous different variables that complicate uh, the answering of the second question. So um, uh, we're uh, very much understanding of the limitations of the survey and its uh, ability to fully answer the question. But um, so we also bore this in mind when preparing uh, the survey, as you'll see from our methodology there, it was uh, circulated primarily um, with our or, or the survey was circulated primarily within ODI's network to past participants of ODI activities such as trainings. Um, this was also supplemented by an effort to reach broader audiences through the ODI's weekly newsletter. Uh, we appreciate that this, uh, that the responses that we received were then uh, part of a convenient sample, which albeit does include a cross section of academia, government, industry, NGOs, uh, and uh, should be considered as illustrative then. Um, but then uh, we also asked the participants two questions. Um, this is all included in the paper, so I'll try to be quick about it. But uh, essentially, we asked uh, the respondents to tell us about their job and uh, the primary role that they perform in these before presenting them with uh, the previously discussed ODI data skills framework. And then we asked them, which side of this do you identify most uh, sort of uh, acutely with? Is it the left hand side and the middle or the right hand side? Uh, the middle could obviously include bits of both from either side. Um, and then the final question that we asked uh, was for respondents to read the corresponding criteria that were there with the levels beforehand um, and ask them which or, or to select all that they would be comfortable of carrying out in a professional capacity. Um, so yes, uh, as the slide there is now up, these are some of the results that we got. I'll try to be quick on these. Uh, it didn't really throw up too many surprises um, given that people like to think they're a bit of a mix of everything, then uh, you will see there from the top table that the uh, vast majority of uh, respondents said that they were uh, they closely aligned with the middle. Uh, it was nice that we happened to by chance get a roughly even balance of those on either side as well. Uh, to go into this a little bit further, just to give you some more context, the kind of people that we had um, um, identifying with the left hand side were quite nicely, um, uh, given the, uh, the sort of more holistic nature of uh, the left hand side of the framework. There, we had some several, uh, we had, sorry, several uh, chief data officers and we had a dean of social sciences and a few directors and CEOs. So those kind of thinking a bit more strategically in the middle, uh, the sort of maybe perhaps translators, jack of all trades, kind of bit of everything. We had primarily consultants and we also had some various analysts such as business data and funnily enough business data um, and we also had some data architects there on the right hand side um, this was uh, unsurprisingly as well given the skills focus um, mainly analysts statisticians and data scientists um, in the second table that you see down here uh, this just shows the kind of um, number of or the percentage of participants for broken down by each side of uh, the data skills framework um, as to um, assessing themselves as having the highest level of data literacy. So that's the five. Um, it's kind of interesting to see actually that uh, it was roughly um, even across all of uh, the different uh, parts of, this, uh, of the framework. Um, and on the next slide, 
um, just essentially some of the quickly the discussion points. Uh, as we saw in the previous slide, uh, the responses were pretty generous uh, with their assessment of um, their level of data literacy. And this kind of chimed with some previous research, particularly uh, that which draws off of uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect um, uh, as being partially responsible for perhaps maybe overestimation or uh, when given a self-assessment task. So on this basis, uh, it appears as though self-assessment methods, particularly when used in isolation of other means, uh, might prove suboptimal when trying to undertake benchmarking. Um, so this is important to first to bear in mind, particularly as uh, a number, if not most, of the benchmarking uh, efforts out there already rely either heavily or solely on self-assessment. Um, and one final kind of discussion point which came out from this uh, within the team uh, was we kind of considered uh, the influence of domain specific knowledge on how uh, survey respondents assess themselves. Um, as you'll see from closer inspection of the criteria uh, for the levels, it gets narrower the further up that you go. So uh, thanks, Dave. Um, so as a result, does this perhaps maybe favor those that have narrower but deeper expertise um, and are able to undertake these uh, activities uh, with greater sort of confidence and competence? Um, that is, though, an area that we'll probably need to focus on a little bit more in some other research. Um, back to Dave. Thanks very much, Callum. Yeah, it does get narrow. It also reflects levels of blooms and education levels. So you know, with these kind of literacy levels, you are looking at well, where does your, your uh, f uh, mandatory education kind of stop and your further education begin? And, and it's interesting, we could probably ask people what kind of education level, you know, do you have, uh, we could do that within the survey to find out whether there's a reflection of that folk narrowness and focus that comes from being at those levels. Um, so alternative approaches to establishing benchmarking data literacy. Well, um, this is kind of inspired by Phil at Glaxis and some of his work around setting people challenges to solve to kind of get a data you know, IQ score in a, in a way and, and looking at how do you present people with the types of challenges that we now mentioned about the um, DEI challenge. And so we've been looking at how, how maybe sending out an assessment which asks people to actually do a multiple choice question, right? And, and how this might start to establish a, a benchmark kind of levels of literacy. Um, so I've got, I've got a few in here, feel free to answer them if you want in the chat. Um, um, but there's a few examples in here, you know, this one, you've been given data relating to people salaries and asked to calculate the average how would you do this so this is more although it looks like a skills question we're subjected to this on a daily basis right we might be subjected to a headline which talks about average salary yeah but how would you calculate that or how has it been calculated and what's the effect of the way that it's been calculated i'm not is anyone gonna yeah <laughs> hold the questions for the next session but feel free if you want to to, to have a go at an answer to this one and and how you might do it other than that i'll um leave it so would you find the total and divide by the number that people are would you sort the salaries in descending order and pick the one in the middle of the sorted list or would you sort the salaries in descending order and find the most common one which one would you do or are they all equally valid a b c or d anyone want to have a go in chat i won't prosecute anyone i won't tease anyone <laughs> Go on, Manuel, which one? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, find the total. Yeah, but that was, A would be, yeah, the, there were, there would be some outliers that, that would skew the, the, the data. So, it, it wouldn't be representative. If we sort them in ascending order and pick the one in the middle, that's a, that's a bit more fair way to, to do it in my, all in my view. Yeah. yeah. And if, if you sort the salaries in ascending order and find the common, the most common one, so the, the mode, I suppose. Well, yeah, that would be that would be also yeah. what I would do. You've you got it. That you've got it there. A is the mean, B is the median, and C is the mode. Yeah. Right. You know, and it takes people back to school as soon as they realize. That, <laughs> yeah. The, the, the modal salary will be minimum wage. The mean salary will be pulled ridiculously high by those people who earn yeah. ridiculously high Yeah, salaries. I would take B. And the B is the median, is the one in the middle everyone forgets about, right? And it's just yeah. like, if, but it, now you consider how that's used within organizations where you might accidentally calculate the mean for a data set that's got a positive skew on it and all of a sudden it's gone horribly wrong. You know, and you're communicating a headline that's instantly going to have an ethical impact on whoever you're communicating it to. And it, 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 starting at that and saying, this is the basics of literacy is understanding when you read a news headline that says the average salary in this organization is X, isn't that bad? 
kind of taking a step back and going, yeah, but which average? Yeah, and, and, and which one are they actually using? And are they trying to influence me in the way that they read it? You know, and, and so there's other stuff in, in this as well. This one's thanks to Carl Bergstrom and Jevon D. West, which said, you know, looking at trends on a graph, you know, here is 11 points plotted. If another 10 points were added, where is this trend going? Right. It, it, this one is kind of interesting because this is a graph where you can actually plot an average which goes to B, a linear regression which goes to C, and a polynomial regression which goes to D. They are all equally valid. So the only one that you can pick is based upon the domain level knowledge. So you have to actually look at the axis labels and go, what domain are we in? But people rarely do when it comes to looking at graphs. And the majority of people just go for C. And, and these kinds of things, like getting this right within organizations, within data literacy levels, when you're looking at stuff and a COVID graph, where are we going? Can I go on holiday in three weeks? It, it, understanding that you can't just plot the obvious trend. You know, that could be completely wrong when the answer to this is D, you know, um, and I love this one as well from Phil, which is just about what's the problem with aggregate statistics. OK, you know, looking at the bottom table here, it's in the paper, if anyone wants this one, it, it, it kind of suggests that the, um, the more successful recruiting organisation from the bottom table in all categories is ACME. But if you summarise that and take all the figures, sum, sum up the column of interviews and offers and then calculate the percentages, ACME would come out, uh, sorry, RRS would come out better. Yeah. It, interesting how statistics, you know, this, this that lies down lies the statistics, right? Make people think about it a little bit more. And, and how do we put these types of thought experiments in front of people to go, well, hang on a minute, I've got to think about not just answering with what I see as the obvious answer, but what what could affect that? And 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 so it, it's interesting that you know Phil at Glaxis has been taking the approach of um I love this data escape rooms setting challenges for people. Um, and, and I'm really interested to see how those evolve as different type ways of running workshops. And I thought, Christoph, you'd be interested in hearing about that. You know, setting people challenges, seeing how they solve them. There is no particular agenda, but you're listening in to see what approaches they take. And then afterwards doing an evaluation with those people to say, what if you'd have taken a different approach and kind of filling in the gaps in their approaches to kind of do that almost training needs analysis that then leads to a more effective data literacy program for an organization based upon solving again, real world problems. So, you know, I love this idea of data escape rooms, not sure if he's patented it yet, but we'll have it. Uh, <laughs> you know, it seems to appeal to the masses, right? Which is one thing about, you know, as Christoph said, how do you get people engaged turning up to these sorts of things? And I'm gonna be really interested to see what happens in the future as we start to th think about how do we engage people at organizations and not just get the Dunning-Kruger effect with benchmarking? So those are the kind of the, the steps that we're trying to take at, at ODI around engaging people with training programs and, and engaging people around things that might look obvious at the start, but actually what, you know, unlocking that opportunity for learning and that keenness for learning where previously there might be a reluctance because you said the word data. Okay. Um, Key resources, data literacy materials on our website, just literally search ODI data literacy, you'll find the homepage. Um, the critical thinking, the art of skepticism in a data-driven world, if anyone hasn't seen this book by Carl Bergstrom and Jevon D. West, it comes off the back of the calling BS course at the University of Washington, well worth a look. Yeah. Um, and the meaning of data fluency from Barton Polson on LinkedIn is actually a really good course for talking about some of this stuff as well. So there is some practical stuff out there. Um, I wish I could point to loads more, but I thought I'd highlight some of the ones that I've found the most useful over the past year or so, um, outside of the ones we know with Manuel and SDSA and everything else, obviously. Well, uh, yeah, actually, those three resources, I would uh, suggest you all to just make a note of it. I, I, have, uh, I have come across them thanks to previous uh, training I've done with the ODI, and actually they are, all, the three of them, quite relevant, and, and, and I, I suggest you, you have a look at them, yeah. Well, thank you everyone very much, everyone, for having us. Okay, well, thank you. So, as I said in the chat, uh, we are, um, if you have any questions, please hold the thought, yeah, and, and, we will, uh, and we will discuss it after the keynote that is going to be uh, shortly. Now, um, according to the schedule, we should have started five minutes ago the presentation of, of, of Maya. But I suggest we have a little bit of a break of five minutes and we will be starting uh, uh, Maya's presentation from Novisat, Maya's presentation at 1455, yeah? 
and and then we will start the keynote also a little bit later ellen will be okay with that ellen mandinach and uh and actually she will be happy because she's uh, she's getting up so early <laughs> so um and then we will we will wrap up the discussion and and we will be able to ask more questions to the oda to both uh david and Callum. how does my plan sound that's good to me okay uh, yeah andrea ah, andrea is yeah andrea has other things to do yeah i remember that that he yeah that he has other meetings so thank you andrea and i will see you okay. soon around Okay, let's play it. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Miami Lorado, and I'm from the University of Movistar, Faculty of Technical Sciences. And today I will present our paper entitled Towards Digital Economy Through Data Literate Workforce. In today's digital economy, data are part of everyone's work. Not only decision makers, but also average workers are invited to conduct data-based experiments, interpret data, and create innovative data-based products and services. This type of competence is uh, united by the name data literacy. And as such, it becomes one of the most valuable skills in the labor market. Today, people are surrounded by the internet and various digital technologies that require data literacy competences. Due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, regular traditional teaching activities have been suspended. Many institutions and organizations are changing their teaching methods and striving to provide a convenient, safe and flexible educational environment for their students. Universities are a starting point for the labor force to acquire data literacy. The development of students' data literacy levels and their digital competences is crucial for improving the effectiveness and efficiency of the learning process, as well as for adapting students to the dynamically changing labor market, which increasingly requires digital competences. Accordingly, this paper aims to highlight the needs and shortcomings in terms of uh, competencies for working with data as a critical factor in the business of modern companies striving for digital transformation. Through systematic desk research spanning over 15 European countries, this paper sheds light on how data literacy is addressed in European higher education and professional training. Data literacy includes skills in reading and interpreting data, critical thinking, and understanding the implications of uh, data application. It is a cornerstone of digital media literacy, a tool of empowerment, and shapes social practices. Access, use, and management of data are increasingly recognized as an essential learning outcome in higher education. Data literacy approaches are usually based on information literacy new approaches to information literacy have emerged that uh, address the way information is used in different disciplinary contexts in which people learn and work technology can be used to transform business processes to do things better or it can be used for uh, innovation doing new things digital transformation can help an organization gain a competitive advantage, simplify business processes, enable cooperation and motivate employees. Information and communication technologies as the main driver of uh, economic growth uh, lead to the development of new products and services and the improvement of uh, productivity in existing tasks and uh, processes. However, the study notes that there are concerns at all levels of government about the lack of qualified people with the necessary level of competences to work with data. Thus, uh, data literacy competencies are strategic 
in nature and are skills needed to take uh, advantage uh, of uh, business opportunities. In uh, the table shown, you can see uh, occupation demand demanding uh, data literacy. Thank you. The results presented in the article are obtained through uh, two studies that show how essential data skills really are. The research was uh, conducted uh, within the Dadalus and Data Lit projects. The first study used the desk research. The data literacy domain was uh, investigated uh, in following countries, the Netherlands, Ireland, the United Kingdom, Spain, France, Germany, Portugal, Austria, Italy, Croatia, Serbia, Lithuania, and Romania. Each country was investigated by a local expert. The desk research was conducted through the following three steps. Search for uh, an educational institution to find modules of competences for working with data or modules that cover these competences. Inclusion of uh, competences frameworks and related documents at all levels and emphasis on learning objectives and uh, competences in developing the curriculum of the module. The second study used a questionnaire on data literacy designed by a data lit project. Data were collected through an online survey. The final sample comprises uh, 704 responses from uh, 20 European and North African countries. The focus uh, was on employees who have a good understanding of data skills. As you can see in a picture, about 55.4% uh, of respondents work in private companies, 20.2% uh, 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 work in higher education institutions, and the remaining 24.3% work in other fields. As for the level of data literacy competences, 26.7% uh, of respondents said they have high knowledge of data literacy competences, 54.2% uh, intermediate, 12.2% uh, low level. In comparison, 6.9% uh, uh, admitted that uh, they do not have any knowledge of data literacy. In that research, despite the homogeneity of the methods used, uh, the results of this study were very uh, different. Definitions of data literacy competencies vary from country to country, and linguistic diversity in Europe carries in some cases the absence of direct translation. This was the case with uh, Spain, Serbia, and Lithuania. There were also significant differences in the maturity of public initiatives across the country specific to uh, data competences. For example, in Ireland and the UK, a national data skills management group uh, produces documents advising how data literacy can be addressed in all disciplines at British universities. Ireland also has documents uh, at the national level that deal with aspects of competency for working with data in the Irish higher education system, again in various disciplines that are not necessarily related uh, to mathematics and computer science. In other countries, such as uh, Serbia and Lithuania, no such documents have been found uh, focusing on data processing skills at the national level using the same search terms. Instead, in this country, data literacy competences are embedded in digital skills and competences, often translated and adapted from wider uh, European Commission documents. With regard to the observed university curricula, uh, great di diversity uh, was also found in the approach to competences for working with data. However, a common trend has been observed uh, different faculties and different uh, academic disciplines have included computer science topics in their modules addressing aspects of data skills. In only survey, uh, given the learning uh, objectives that, and the competences of the observed programs, 
uh, these programs aim to develop a wide range of competences. After reviewing uh, all these competences, the consortium made a list of five groups of competences, data protection and security, data selection and critical assessment, data processing, data analysis, and data visualization. According to the ranking of respondents, uh, competences related to soft skills that respondents consider to be uh, the most uh, important for working with data are shown in the picture. Evaluation of data was found as the most important soft competence uh, related to competences for working with data, uh, followed by critical thinking, problem solving, communication, and learning. In other words, from an industry uh, perspective, an employee's most valuable soft skill is the ability to evaluate or reflect on data. Also, the key competence of data literacy is uh, critical thinking. Critical thinking allows employees to uh, critically select, evaluate, and analyze data. Uh, previous studies have also found that decision makers with data competences must be able to think critically about data in order to make uh, informed decisions. In terms of functional competences, respondents believe that uh, reading or creating a classification of data or rules is the most important competence, while reading or creating weather trends and forecasts is the least important. From a business perspective, their employees must have skills related uh, to reading or creating a data classification. It is of particular importance uh, when it comes to risk management, compliance and data security. The second most important functional skill is the uh, ability to search and uh, retrie retrieve uh, data that has already been uh, published. Uh, many sources often publish uh, data sets for public use. For example, many governments uh, host open government platforms for the data they generate. The first study provides an overview of the ways in which competences for working with data are processed in European higher education and professional development. Through the ASK research of more than 15 European countries, formal curricula and educational documents were examined to identify uh, the strengths and challenges of uh, increasing the need for data skills and to identify needs and opportunities for training programs specific to these skills that uh, promote culture within the ecosystem of European industry. Unlike the first study, the second includes uh, soft skills, uh, bridging the gap between academia and industry in terms of key competences for working with data is becoming critical as it is uh, considered to be the most important uh, issue of the 21st century. Uh, this study showed that the most valuable competence for working with employee data is the ability to evaluate uh, or consider data, as well as skills related to reading or creating a classification of data. These uh, results uh, will support universities and industry to offer innovative, uh, competence-based cross-data courses. In addition, the goal is to narrow the gap between businesses and academia and to put European companies in direct contact with uh, potential future employees or business partners who are properly trained to effectively understand and uh, use data. Higher education needs to keep step with the rapid pace uh, of the digital revolution, uh, which is significantly changing the labor market and shaping the skills uh, of successful future workers in all fields. Introducing education uh, for data skills is not an easy task for universities, uh, primarily due to the lack of uh, a common understanding of uh, what data education means in all disciplines 
and what elements are necessary for the busy higher education curriculum. This is clear uh, by looking at the data literacy courses that, come, that uh, some European uh, higher education institutions already offer. They include very different topics and lead to different levels of competences, uh, creating a shared uh, understanding of data education is something that uh, universities alone cannot achieve. They need to work closely with businesses and understand the needs of this essential partner. Within the paper, two studies are presented that clearly speak about the importance of data literacy competences and indicate their insufficient level of development. The needs of different jobs for these competences are given, which are becoming more and more obligatory and avoidable instead of desirable by the candidates. The need uh, for uh, skilled employees in data management stems from the fact that the digital economy and digital transformation uh, and the mass transition to a digital businesses require companies to achieve and maintain their competitive advantage. The presented studies have singled out the soft and functional skills necessary for a person who has the uh, competencies to work with data. As the importance of competencies for working with data for the digital economy and for business in general uh, has been proven, it is very important to notice that the mismatch between the industry needs uh, for staff with these competencies and people with those competencies created by different uh, universities. Most faculties do not offer the appropriate level of uh, education required to develop the uh, required data skills. The importance and necessity of uh, these competencies have not been yet been properly recognized and are not uh, integrated into the regular courses uh, offered to students at the faculties. In order to bridge this gap between what the economy demands and what the academic community offers, it is necessary to achieve close cooperation between these parties. It would be ideal for creating appropriate study programs in accordance with the uh, requirements of the economy, but such a change will require significantly more time. During that time, it is necessary to include competences for working with data in uh, other courses and work on uh, spreading awareness of how crucial they are for the conditions of uh, modern electronic businesses. Uh, all taught competences for uh, working with data are still not uh, sufficiently close uh, and uh, uh, valued concept. Their importance should not be neglected or uh, overlooked. This study has uh, limitations uh, that need to be considered. Uh, the results are based on a desk survey conducted in uh, 15 European countries. Future studies should focus on uh, all countries in Europe to allow for greater generalization of results. Also, only one research instrument was used. It is assumed that the questionnaire together with the desk research can shed light uh, on all competencies related to working with data. And future studies should focus uh, on various methods such as interviews with experts and uh, focus groups to confirm or discover new competences. Thank you for, for your attention. Yeah, I think that's the video. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you, Yushun. And thank you, Maya, for, for the presentation. I, it's very, uh, I have found it very well laid out and it explores all the topics, all the wide range of, of topics that we have been covering in this workshop today, especially what, what, uh, what is needed in industry and, and what are we serving from education in terms of data literacy and what are the challenges 
and uh, and yeah very well uh yeah very well said what you suggest of kind of uh, of, of of saying okay it's not only surveys that we have to do uh, we we also have to talk to people directly to see what is needed and and if we discover new uh, not only confirm the competences that, that that competencies around data literacy that we have already identified but also uh to probably um, discover new uh, new things or, or, or new aspects of data literacy that we may not be aware, even if we have been talking about it for so long. Yes, so I totally agree with this need of keeping the keeping the research, especially the qualitative research. Yeah, to, talking to people. Um, well, now I was gonna say so. Um, uh, Maya may have a little challenge uh, with with sound and she might not be able to answer questions so we can do two things we can either move to the uh to the uh to, to the keynote that i will introduce properly or we can uh, or if anyone has got a burning question that they that that you, you that you really need to ask why don't you write it in the chat if anyone has a specific question, Maya will probably be able to answer also typing in the chat. Anyone? Or we can uh, uh, move to the to the keynote and then in the plenary discussion that, that will take place after the keynote, we can keep discussing about uh, uh, about this uh, this presentation and the rest of the presentations as well, and of course we will have many questions for for Ellen, our keynote. So I'm going to yeah we're I'm going to introduce Ellen Mandinach. I think she's here with us. Let me yeah uh, Ellen is with us. Hi Ellen, you, you are with us twice actually. That's great. Um, David, David and I, uh, when we were researching back uh, a, a couple of years back, and we were uh, gathering papers about late data literacy, and there was a recurrent name in the uh, that we were finding that we were finding in in the different databases with very interesting articles about uh, teaching data literacy and and and, and quite a, and quite re uh, quite relevant uh, literature about it. And 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 it was Ellen that and we we thought well, well why don't we approach her and and we talk to her maybe she will she will reply and she did yeah and and then we invited her for for this keynote and and we are so lucky that she said yes and here we are she's going to uh, she's going to to give us a, a, a her her view on the cultural dimension of teaching data literacy and and how important this construct is and i don't think i'm going to describe it much more because she's going to tell us about it much better so i think uh, uh, without further ado ellen why don't you introduce yourself a little bit and and and, and uh, proceed with the with the keynote hi ellen I would say good morning, but it's morning in Arizona. Uh, it's afternoon in, in Europe and wherever everyone is. And when Manuel, and I'm honored to be here, um, when Manuel asked me, I'm thinking about doing the time conversion, thinking, wait a minute, I'm going to wake up my husband and my cat, um, but all good. Um, I'm an educational psychologist by training. I work at a nonprofit organization based in San Francisco, even though I live in Arizona. Uh, and for the past 25 years, have been doing um, a great deal of work on data use in general. And in the past, since I think 2010, 2011, what has emerged is that technologies came first, build the technological infrastructure. They forgot about the human capacity infrastructure of what does it mean, particularly in education, for educators to know how to use data both effectively and responsibly. And so, as Manuel said, yeah, there are a lot of papers out there, and um, I, I will go. I will share my screen and uh, 
and go through, but this has been an ongoing um, collaboration and, and work over the past, oh, tw uh, 12 years now. So let me share my screen and get the PowerPoint up and we'll go from there and hope everything will work. Um, so what, when I was approached about doing this uh, presentation, the work that we originally started to do was simply on what we call data literacy for teachers or data literacy for educators. But what we soon realized uh, in the United States and probably elsewhere is the diversity of people who are uh, using data, who are impacted by data, particularly students, that at least in the United States, the diversity of children uh, is palpable. And so what we did and what I would like to do today is to introduce to you what we call an emerging construct um, and think about its implications for uh, education writ large in research and development, uh, in how you train educators and how we think about using data more generally. When we started this work, we, the construct, uh, what we refer to as DLFT, Data Literacy for Teachers, the key on this slide, um, and in, in meant much of the data, liter data use uh, literature, it's always about taking data to information, to knowledge and making it actionable. So the key here is about using diverse types of data, not just student performance uh, indicators, such as test scores, assessments, but thinking much more about behavior, uh, motivation, uh, justice data, health data, uh, home context, all of that. It could be a snapshot, it could be longitudinal data, it could be what in education we call formative or moment to moment. The key of this is not just to determine instructional steps, but many kinds of steps, uh, whether it's how to address somebody who is being bullied, um, somebody who's having a behavioral issue, a health issue, so on and so forth, with the bottom line to help all ch children succeed and learn. Um, what is it? What is this construct we're talking about? We've spent 10 years, more years, uh, doing research and theoretical layout of knowledge, skills, dispositions um, to help uh, educators use data appropriately. Uh, I'll show you the 50 some odd skills. My husband was, was trying to help me um, come up with a pithy title for the new book that was coming out in 2016. And since we had over 50 skills, knowledge dispositions, he said, well, why don't you call it 50 shades of data instead of 50 shades of gray, thinking that might sell and be a little bit more uh, alluring to folks because you know, in this, in education, not, not much sells, but we didn't, we, we, we came up with an appropriate professional title. Um, for those of you who are not aware of the term dispositions, they're really generic habits of minds. So it's educators being able to communicate with one another, collaborate with one another, having general fundamental habits that they put into play, not just the specific cognitive skills and knowledge that they need to, uh, to put into play. Uh, it's based on Lee Shulman's seven forms of knowledge that are important for an educator. You need to have knowledge of your content domain, uh, your pedagogy, uh, knowledge of the students, the context, so on and so forth. All of these play fundamentally into how to use data. Originally, we thought it was just a matter of a teacher knowing the content and then knowing what to do pedagogically by using the data, but it's much more complex than that. So this is what our conceptual framework looks like. And what you can see at the top are Shulman's seven forms of knowledge. And then um, the actual use of, of data and five, what we call components. Everything begins with, and, and I'll go to the, um, uh, the inquiry cycle. Most every uh, theoretical uh, framework of data use is about an inquiry cycle. It's cyclical, it's iterative. So one would begin with, and I, and I hate this term because it is a negative, identifying a problem of practice or framing a question. So what is it that we need to know? Then it is about, and we struggled with what to call this component because there are maybe 20 some odd skills and knowledge in there. Um, what is it to use data? So there are things in there about how to uh, understand data properties around data quality, 
how to access data through technology, um, some fundamental data use. Then it moves to the transformation of data into information through generation of hypotheses, testing assumptions, interpretation of data, understanding the potential negative and positive consequences, unintended and intended. Um, then it goes to what really is the pedagogical aspect of, um, of the cycle, which is transforming the information into a decision and to action. So for a teacher, it would be understanding what instructional steps to take, understanding the context for that decision, understanding uh, and feedback of what's going on with the student as I'm making a decision. And then finally, it's about um, evaluating the outcomes through the iterative decision-making cycle, rethinking your original question, figuring out, have I solved that problem? Is it sufficient? And then having to cycle back because it really never is a done deal, a finite um, part of a continuum. It really is the iterative cyclical inquiry process. So why has this become important? Uh, and I, I just saw friends from the Netherlands and Belgium last, uh, last week at the American Educational Research Association meeting in San Diego, and they're doing fabulous, fabulous work. And things are not much different uh, in uh, those European countries um, that I'm familiar with than in the United States. In about 2005 in, in the United States, there was a big move for our US Department of Education to become more evidence-based. It was insufficient, inappropriate, simply to use gut feelings, anecdotes, experience, although experience is important for an educator, but to become really evidence-based. And so the push for data uh, became important. And there was, uh, there was uh, many, many millions of dollars expended on building the technological infrastructure at the United States states, forgetting about, as I said, the, uh, the human capacity. The policy has moved over the past two decades and unclear uh, in, in your situations um, elsewhere. We've always conflated data with accountability. Uh, to look good in PISA, to look good in all of the international and national accountability measures, basically by test scores. And that's about compliance and accountability. Now the movement is uh, more toward continuous improvement of a, of a school, a building, a classroom, an individual student. And fundamentally that's different because the sources of data would be different. The skills, maybe not so much. But even the same data for a school leader might have different meaning and different use for uh, somebody who's in the classroom dealing with, uh, with children. There is a conflation. Um, the prior uh, speaker was talking about data literacy, but what we have seen, and hopefully this is decreasing at this point, is that there is conflation, a definitional problem between what we refer to as assessment literacy and data literacy. They're overlapping, but in my opinion and my colleague's opinion is that assessment literacy is a component of data literacy, data, data being a much uh, overarching concept because data are diverse or should be diverse. It's not just about assessments, test scores, student indices. And this is very important when we think about how to um, approach this with educators because Probably 99% of the time when I ask an educator or a stakeholder or a parent, what are data? They're going to say test scores. And we need to broaden that concept, particularly as students are more diverse <clears throat> and we need to deal with their, their growing contextual um, and cultural differences that they bring to a classroom. Um, switching to what's known as culturally responsive practice or culturally responsive teaching, uh, these are the characteristics, experiences, the backgrounds uh, from ethnically diverse students that help an educator to understand how to approach them, to teach them more effectively. It assumes that when academic knowledge and skills are situated in experiences, that's their frame. And we need to appeal to students in a more meaningful way. So it's uh, tapping their interests, their assets, their context, their backgrounds, their student histories. Um, as a result, academic achievement of ethnically diverse students will improve, we think, 
when there is more attention to their experiential and their cultural backgrounds and filters. So, you know, for students who have never seen uh, certain farm animals, how do you talk to them about it? Or those who are in a rural area, how do you uh, bring to bear things that they might see in a city? Understanding those backgrounds and tapping into them. The importance of merging the data literacy with the cultural responsiveness is really about this conflation that I mentioned about accountability. What literature has shown definitively is that the more you focus on accountability data, the more it marginalizes the most vulnerable populations of students because tests do not adequately depict what a student can and cannot do. We make assumptions, you know, there are, you know, the, the diaspora of many um, uh, cultural groups uh, who you know, say the Afghanis, uh, the United States has taken in many Afghani rep refugees. Teachers may say, oh, these are lang English language as uh, students. They don't know what they don't know, but they come with a very rich background and we need to take into consideration those backgrounds and play off their strengths rather than their deficits. Um, the culturally responsive data literacy conversation takes an asset model. Instead of talking about a problem of practice or a learning deficit, we talk about their strengths and capitalize on that. And my organization, WestEd, uh, has a very real push of looking at the whole child. So understanding what medical issues they might have that impacts their ability to learn. What uh, a student with disability, a student with a certain background, uh, a student who may come from poverty, a student uh, perhaps who's, uh, whose parent is deployed in the military that has moved from school to school and has been unable to set down roots, make friends and suffers from socio-emotional issues. So understanding the whole child, particularly through uh, as diverse sets of data as possible to understand comprehensively what the child looks like and how to, uh, to help them succeed. So our definition of culturally responsive data literacy is, is simply um, the ability to use diverse data sources, and that's really critical, and other key data literacy skills, uh, and you only saw a snippet of them, to inform decision-making about the whole child, using an equity lens and an asset-based model to better serve the needs of all children, not just those who are most in need at the end of the spectrum or those who are most gifted or what happened in the United States when we had um, a compliance accountability measure called No Child Left Behind, where the key was getting children over the, um, the hurdle to passing, uh, not remembering that children can backtrack as well. So we need to address all children in ways that make sense. Um, a further definition, and again, this goes to expanding the kinds of data that are important. Now we're talking about socio-emotional learning, motivation, home context, health, justice. And in the wake of the pandemic, the issue around socio-emotional learning has become almost tantamount. Students and teachers and educators have encountered just multitudes of trauma and if we cannot get the kids, first of all, attending school, now that they're, they're no longer in a virtual environment, attending school and being engaged, dealing with their trauma and socio-emotional well-being, they're never going to be able to uh, achieve in their performance. And this is about helping to un an educator to understand what steps to, uh, to make educational decisions, not just instructional ones, as I said, based on context, background, interests, strengths surrounding information uh, that may not only affect their performance, but also their behavior. The colleague with whom I'm working on the culturally responsive data, uh, culturally responsive part of data literacy, Sarosha Warner, um, comes from um, diversifying educator talent. And she sees this as seeking also broad sources, but it's looking at the unique experiences of the children, their personal history, Interrogating bias, identifying it, hitting it square on. We all have hidden biases. Uh, we all use what's called confirmation bias, uh, assuming that uh, if a, a, a child is X, then they won't be able to do Y. 
or they will be able to do Z. Um, but looking at those biases, confronting them, and thinking about what are the appropriate kinds of interventions, instructional supports, resources, and materials that can necessarily support uh, student performance uh, and student behavior. So uh, for those of you in the education realm, uh, I uh, turn you to the work of um, Melanie Bertrand and Julie Marsh. In a paper six, uh, six or seven years ago, they talk about the importance of attributions and they had four. The key is if you attribute a student's performance to their non-malleable characteristics, their ethnicity, their culture, uh, and say a student of this background is simply unable to uh, perform because they're dumb or they're this or they're that, then that is a deficit model and it's a non-malleable factor. But if you look more generally and attribute maybe poor uh, performance of your students to, maybe the curriculum wasn't right. Maybe I didn't teach it right. Maybe it wasn't assessed right. These are malleable factors. And that kind of messaging is absolutely critical in helping to, to uh, align the right kinds of data with the right kinds of needs of students to the right kinds of interventions. And then just last year, they published uh, another piece that, and it's a, it's a wonderful piece that is outwardly facing, not so much in the research literature, but to the practice audience uh, in the United States about the harmful impact of using a deficit model, the problem of practice, the uh, learning deficit. So again, it is about the messaging of how to move forward and how to turn that into an asset model. Again, this, this is absolutely critical. I've said it before about the, uh, the shift, the marginalization that comes from accountability and the move to compliance and the work of Al, David Berliner, Sharon Nichols. Uh, Sharon Nichols just uh, gave a presentation on uh, my new book on data ethics um, at this conference in, in San Diego. Um, I urge you to take a look at uh, their work because it, it shows the long and sordid history at least in the United States, um, but anywhere where there are accountability measures against which educators have to strive to succeed. I remember being at a conference many years ago in Singapore where the, uh, the Minister of Education got up and said, in order to be the best, we have to test for the best, something of that ilk. And um, you know, it's more, it, there's more than just testing. So what is needed, the whole child, approach, the asset model, the moving away from shaming and blaming educators, shaming and blaming a child. You didn't learn this stuff because you, you're you dumb. Uh, you didn't teach this well. Uh, you're being uh, blamed as a teacher for not doing well for the most challenged students. So the goal here is to reduce the marginalization of the most vulnerable students. Let me give you a couple examples of, of how uh, the culturally responsive perspective uh, impacts. In our capital, Washington, DC, there is, um, there's large poverty in, in segments. Um, it's a, it has been uh, a highly African American uh, population with children struggling. Um, and I heard a, a teacher, a young teacher speak about how they had a program that prior to the beginning of school, she was asked to go to each student's home, no notes, no nothing, have an informal, what they called a meet and greet, uh, in which she would talk to the parent or the guardian of every student, get to know them, get to know their home context and their needs. And this woman's co uh, comment was, several of my students are in homeless shelters or in foster care. How would I have known that that circumstance occurs most students don't talk about it unless I had done these home visits. Because of having this uh, situational and contextual set of information through her observations, she was better able to tailor to those students about their needs. Um, it, it was just, it was heartwarming to hear her say that. Um, another educator in our New England states, as a principal, she took her, her her school staff, her teachers on a bus tour 
of the area that her, her school uh, served. And what she found out was that there was intense poverty of students living without electricity, without running water, without sanitation, uh, and dire, dire poverty. If she had not taken that tour and understood how these students are living, she might not have known how to address those issues. They're important sources of data. Um, another example, in, in some areas uh, where there's no Wi-Fi connection, uh, educators assume that all students have um, connectivity, that they can give an assignment that's based on you know, doing research um, online and writing a report or, or whatever the assignment is. But if students don't have use of Wi-Fi and not everyone can go to a public library or whatever. So one of the sources, um, uh, resources they provided was to put Wi-Fi hubs on school buses and park them in communities where there was a lack of Wi-Fi, which enabled the students, well, maybe they were shopping or doing something else, but the hope was for them to do their assignments and uh, better enable them to succeed. Culturally responsive data literacy has become even more important in the wake of the pandemic. In the United States, during our lockdown, students went virtual. Uh, I assume the same thing in, uh, in your countries. The issue, many, many issues, particularly of data privacy and data security emerged through the virtual environments. Educators were able to see students' uh, homes where you know, they might see that a student um, is, is unclean, that they have not been washed, that their, their clothing is torn, that somebody is, is bullying them, or that uh, a parent in the background is having a fight, or uh, um, that the children are being abused or doing drugs or any of these things of understanding what is the environment behind the student. In the United States, Every educator is called a mandated reporter. And I know the data privacy issues in um, Europe are much more strong um, than in the United States, but they have a, a responsibility, a legal responsibility to um, address these, to report anything that they see that could be harmful to a child. You can see that in face-to-face -face, uh, conversations if a child's being bullied, if a child comes to, uh, to school inappropriately dressed, you see that, but in a virtual environment, and the question became both about data privacy and data ethics of what is the responsibility, what data are protected in virtual environments as opposed to in face-to-face? -face? Do you require cameras on? Do you uh, is it okay not to? So many of those issues emerged through the pandemic and will continue. So the bottom line of this is that responsible data use and ethics, and we, we feel that data ethics is, uh, is a fundamental part of culturally responsive data literacy. And part of this uh, around data literacy and the data ethics is that we need to expand our notion of the data to be able to address all children. So some considerations for you to think about. As an educator, or if you put yourself in the place of an educator, what do I know about my students' visible and invisible cultures? So a teacher might make assumptions about a student from this religion or that background, or if they have that, um, you know, that color. We know things, there, there's discrimination in certain technologies. For schools that use um, um, uh, audio capturing, uh, voice recognition systems are biased against people with any kind of accent. So is visual recognition that if you're not, and it was, it was planned on white males. So if you are a female or you are a person of color, uh, there's bias there. But what do we know about both their invisible backgrounds and their visible? How can we advantage, thinking about any action an educational uh, practitioner can take, how might my actions advantage or disadvantage certain students? Who has the power? Who might be privileged by those actions? Who might be marginalized? Who might be oppressed? And these are pretty heady 
important questions that people generally don't think about. If you don't know about the student's personal history, about their uh, backgrounds, and if you don't confront your own personal biases about, what, uh, about particular students, you have no idea what kinds of unintended consequences might happen. We know in the data privacy aspect that certain things may have unintended consequences. To give you an example, um, a professor was grading an examination on a plane, had his laptop open, and somebody walked down from uh, the lavatory. The laptop was open. The, the, um, the person looked over the professor's shoulder, knew the name of the, uh, the student, and that the student failed and posted on social media. If your name is such and such and you're taking this course, you've just failed. That's an un unintended consequence of a professional, an instructor or professor doing his or her work uh, in a public circumstance. So understanding the importance of unintended consequences of what are really potentially innocent actions. So what we've done uh, to help uh, educators attain their understanding and uh, awareness of culturally responsive um, uh, data literacy is three sets of guiding questions. The first is to understand a student's academic history, the normal sorts of things about their performance history, um, formative and, um, and more long-term, understanding the personal history, everything that I've just spoken about, and to confront, confront your implicit biases. And these are things that, you know, that you know, at least in the United States, people assume that athletes are not smart. But in order to be uh, a, a football player, a soccer player, or a tennis player, you need to be able to understand physics, you need to understand angles and mathematics. Uh, so making a general blatant statement about all athletes are not smart is wrong. And, and I don't want to um, uh, offend anyone, so I won't go any farther than that. Uh, but there are implicit biases that we all bring to our practice. So, so some of these in the academic performance, they're the usual summative assessments, observations. And this is you know, looking at a student and saying, are they on task? Are they engaged? Are they understanding? Um, and also including experiences about perceptions, bullying, records of student interactions with peers. So this is all about what has happened in their school, what has happened in their academic history. In the second domain, it's about their home context, their access to healthcare, their access to food, transportation, traumatic experiences. Now with all the students that are, say are moving from the Ukraine and being uh, recultured in uh, the Eastern European countries, how are they going to be able to be um, accommodated in those schools. In the United States, we have issues around, uh, and this has happened most recently, um, there is bias against uh, students who are LGBTQ, their sexual orientation, and there is blatant bias uh, in that realm uh, in schools. Uh, so how do you help deal with that? Uh, how do you help deal with food insecurities? Students who have no food at home, who, may uh, who are given backpacks uh, to take home their food for the weekend because there's no food at home. So all of these play into the importance of understanding the student. And then, as I said, the interrogation of bias. So making sure that those biases do not influence your choice about what kinds of instructional materials, what kinds of interventions to use, how to influence how you interact with a student. Just last week and the week before in our state of Florida, uh, the State De uh, Department of Education rejected many mathematics textbooks because they talk about social emotional learning and they talk about sexual orientation and what we call critical race theory. It's a bias on their part with no questions asked uh, about how you present uh, uh, instructional information. So there is bias, there continues to be in bias. And unfortunately in the United States, perhaps elsewhere, it is politically motivated. And it's just not right because it's not going to help us to use the appropriate data to address the needs of all of the students most vulnerable. My contact information, uh, happy to, um, to 
uh, answer any questions. Um, ha well, it's, it's a US number, but I'm happy to uh, be reached at uh, that email address and um, open to any questions. So I will stop sharing at this point and uh, turn it back to Manuel. Well, thank you. I uh, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to do this icon of applause as well because <laughs> yeah, we all liked it so much. Um, I think uh, um, I yeah, well, of, obviously I have questions, but I'm going to I'm going to give uh, to give way to other people to 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 ask you. Uh, questions about your presentation first, and then I will I will do mine. So, anyone has got any question? Yeah, I, they, David. I knew because of the background in uh, of the picture and the fair. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you very much Ellen that was a really inspiring talk um, much appreciated I come from very much an educated myself not quite involved with the same kind of children but I, I just wanted to um, ask ask you a little bit about you talked about two prongs of the approach your technology came first then we had to remember about the people okay um, there's a third prong I think in there somewhere which is around the process like what process is actually supporting the people to incentivize them so in this case the teachers right to to get engaged at this level because I don't know if it's the same case in the US but you know teachers are already overwhelmed where I am in the UK and in Europe with everything else they have to do so what kind of processes had to be put in place to make sure that this became a priority that's a great question and uh, I will speak uh, from the United States and what I know about, uh, at least in the Netherlands. The Netherlands has um, money to provide for professional development of existing educators. And um, there's a professor at the University of Trente, uh, Kim Schildkamp, who's done work in the UK as well, Sweden and, uh, and elsewhere, where their ministers of education make sure that all educators in, uh, in the Netherlands understand about the use of data. In the United States, unfortunately, professional development uh, monies are, are sparse. And they will typically go to uh, key issues around, say, a new textbook, a new curriculum. So data is not a high point. So we've taken two approaches. One, and um, Saroja Warner and I will be um, making a presentation in June to our professional association that puts into these, our state standards. They, what we are giving them is the kinds of language that you've seen to say in a state standard, colleges of education that prepare our future educators and then bring them back for graduate must not so much have a standalone data course, but integrate the concepts of data use, data ethics, CRDL, into the preparation in different courses like classroom management, assessment, uh, their practical experiences, so that they get a taste of the importance in their pre-service experiences. And then because it's mandated, have it the trajectory of learning also uh, continue on past that into their professional development and technical assistance. We're working very, very hard now we have a chicken and egg issue here, David, in that we need resources to be able to do this. And uh, we are trying to find funding to be able to create materials for both uh, pre-service and con uh, continuing practice educators so that they will be able to have uh, trained to and knowledge about. One of the things that Saroja and I did was we created a couple scenarios uh, to to show what could be done, having uh, things like the full list of these three um, sets of guiding questions to be able to confront educators, to have them think about in say uh, school meetings, faculty meetings, or in their courses of, if you think about this, what does this, what is the implication? So we're trying to develop materials and I'm a researcher, not a developer, but I'm trying to translate it. The thing that we have done, and it's around data privacy, data ethics, is that there are uh, now four resources that we have created solely on data privacy, data ethics that are out there for teachers. 
based on authentic scenarios, authentic situations with a user's guide to help educators understand the ramifications of that example of grading um, a paper on, you know, and many of these things are just um, innocent. Like uh, you, know, you have a wall behind you, uh, but if you were a teacher, putting up your students' papers with their names and their grades is a violation of data privacy. Um, and there are many, many things that are out there that they're unaware. Many of the apps, and I don't want to denigrate the technology providers, you know, if, if you go to your, you know, your mobile device, what has the technology developer done underneath to siphon off those data? Educators aren't aware of that. Uh, so you know, where are the data going and how are they being used? So first of all, building awareness and second of all, building capacity. Um, and, and if any of you are interested in those um, data privacy, data ethics um, sources, email me, I, I'm happy to, to share them with you. What we're now doing is expanding from the teachers to the, built, to the administrative level, because at least what happens in the US is a teacher will say, I've got a problem or they'll get accused of doing something wrong and it will go to their principal, their building leader. And the, it is incumbent upon the leader to know what to do. So there are specific situations in these kinds of pass-throughs that we're now developing the administrative ones with the help of someone at Texas Christian University who teaches leadership, who has been a principal. So they're coming down the pike, but the, the problem, David, is many of the, the I'm gonna sound ageist, many of the older teachers still don't recognize the importance of this because they haven't been trained. And in fact, those, who, those younger teachers who are coming out need to be in a school culture in which there are, there's a data leader or a data coach, a data facilitator, a data team, and the whole culture and the provision for resources to enable people to interrogate those data, have conversations and collaborate about discussions. So say, I'm a teacher, I'm struggling with Manuel. And I come to you, David, and say, you know, you had him last. Don't we all? Sorry. You know, you had him last year. What successful strategies did you use to approach him? And I'm struggling. And then I need a leader who is astute enough to not shame and blame me for saying, oh, Ellen failed at addressing the student's need, but a collaborative effort of trying to figure out appropriate strategies to move that student forward. And Manuel will succeed. Nice. Yeah, looking forward to that. <laughs> and, and I would love to chat further on the F the ODI has, we've been talking data ethics for the last God knows how long we have the data ethics canvas that we have as a tool. We have the consequent scanning toolkit, which speaks well to what you were saying there as well. I'd love and to I'd... have a conversation about that if we might at some oh, let, at, let, at, let, at, let, a sidebar at some point. Let's get that in the diary at a slightly later time so you don't have to wake up husband and cat, but let's do that. I'll pop, pop you in my, actually, I'll put my email in chat. Let's, let's, because I missed it on the slide, but let's, let's chat. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, and I'll put mine in as well. Yes, that's, uh, that's great. Actually, there are, there are also some projects in, in Europe at European level that, uh, that address this this issue not o not only for the older teachers but all teachers who have this uh, who who have this um, challenge of of being able to uh, to leverage all the data that the the school generates yeah because they they are sitting on so, lots of records lots of uh, of lists marks. Uh, um, uh, behavior, uh, behavior reports, etc. So everything and how to put it together and how uh, and how and how to uh, make the right decisions based on the data that is already there. Well, it's a whole process. You first you have to find it. You have to you, you have to put it together. You have to uh, pre-process it, and then you have to analyze it, and then you have to make sense of it. Yeah, and. And there is, uh, yeah, there is certain aware, awareness around that, that 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 teachers with so many things they have to do uh, every day, with so many things they have on their plate. Well, there is no real thing to 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 leverage the power of learning analytics in general. Yeah. 
So, um, so there is a there was a there is what there was a very nice uh, project specifically for teachers and more uh, more specifically for key, key, key stage uh, uh, for secondary you know uh, teachers of the, uh, to from twelve to eighteen years old. Uh, uh, that it was called Learn to Analyze. And I joined, and they produced a MOOC that is still available. Uh, MOOC is an, a, a free course, yeah, free online course, massive open online course. And I thought I thought it was very useful. However, these initiatives, I don't, I don't see that they are still uh, reaching as much audience as as they should do because there is no I don't think there is enough dissemination efforts or investment basically to 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 make this a kind of a, it should be even a requirement yeah for a, in teacher in teacher training while they are training use the use the data is is one of the main digital skills for teachers uh, and and for educators that that have to that that have to achieve today nowadays in this data driven society but yeah well that's what that's what we do and and that's what we have to keep doing so uh, organizing this kind of workshops and and writing as many papers as we and disseminate as much as we can yes because it's well, a, manual to to that point a couple of things one again it's what people think about data because the data that people usually get in their training are you know how to do a test score and they need to broaden their thoughts. And I'll give you an example. Um, I was interviewing uh, one young educator and she was saying, I don't have time to analyze data when I get home and put them into a spreadsheet. She said, well, when you were in class, weren't you observing your students? Weren't you checking, seeing if you know, their eyes were rolling back, whether they were attending to what you were doing, uh, whether they were flirting with the boy next door, you know, you know, whether they were on task, whether they had their head down on their desk and sleeping. And you saw the light bulb go on to understand uh, her expansion of the idea of what data are, because so much is taken in by um, observation for educators. It, yeah. uh, and it, it, it's really about thinking about what are the data, um, because unfortunately they all just re revert back to the narrow version uh, and the narrow view. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And and now this this view, uh, yeah, we think it has broadened a little bit uh, because with the digitalization of, of education, students leave many more traces than just their performance. Yeah, they leave behavioral traces or they leave interaction traces. Yeah. What do they speak to each other? What is what what they are most interested in? Uh, even network traces. Who is the most influential, etc. So there are many dimensions of data that can be uh, that that can can be uh, harnessed for for improving the way we the way we serve, yeah, the way we provide yes. education. Do we have any more questions? Okay, so I think, uh, David, why, why don't we have a last 10 minutes of plenary discussion uh, to wrap up the whole, uh, the whole thing. And, and we kind of, uh, yeah, we focus on, on this transition from, so from education to being out there, not only in the professional uh, in the pro in the professional world, but in the in, in society. Yes, yeah? so we are not only forming we are not only educating workers; we are educating citizens. Yeah, so um, why don't we uh, wrap up a little bit on, on all that? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I think it would be great to to end up with the, um, yeah, a few remarks that emerged from the uh, talks that we have had uh, today. Uh, first of all, I would like also to thank you, Alan, for your uh, talks. That was very. Um, very inspiring and was great. I mean, it was uh, you touch uh, many points that uh, um, have been of uh, my interest for uh, in the last few years of uh, research on the data literacy uh, domain. Uh, yeah, I, I ask that the the help of all of you the uh, and in trying to. Uh, 
underline the most important points that uh, have been uh, that came out from uh, the this workshop. Uh, the first, the first one that I, I have in mind is the um, differences between the uh, data science and the data literacy. That uh, uh, these two uh, topics are often um, confused, and uh, many, um, many times uh, we have. The, um, um, the the data science have been uh, the, the terms data science have been used uh, in in place of uh, uh, data literacy but now i mean that uh, uh, we see that there are a lot of research and a lot of experiences in which uh, the role of uh, um, the literacy about data is, is it's completely different from uh, the the expertise on uh, on data science. I mean, this has been confirmed by uh, many of the the, the, the uh, presenters today. Another important point, as you say, Manuel, from my side, uh, is the, that uh, um, we, it, it, the da data literacy is, is not uh, is not something uh, connected just to professionals or, or to university students or to experts in 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 the uh, in, in in the field, but uh, it's something that uh, uh, is connected to citizen in. Uh, um, in general, I mean, uh, it's a, a very uh, crucial competence that uh, has to has, has to be uh, developed in, uh, uh, in 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 uh, in citizen at all level. I mean, from uh, I, I really think from even from primary school to uh, university. I mean, it, it is not something that is uh, is useful only for. Uh, um, yeah, university students that has to look look for a new job or or for adults or for whatever. I mean, it's it's it is a very um, uh, fundamental um, competence, and. Uh, um, <clears throat> I, uh, I, I, and finally, I mean, from uh, Ellen's thoughts, uh, we, we saw uh, their relevance in uh, teaching data literacy. I mean, it is not, uh, it, it, we need uh, specific methodologies, we, we need uh, uh, specific models also uh, to uh, cope with uh, um, issues in uh, teaching data literacy that uh, it's uh, as a fundamental uh, competence needs to be uh, faced with the uh, proper uh, tools. Uh, these are the, the key points from my side. I mean, I, but I don't I really would like to also add from you all. I mean, what what do you think about the the, the, the key points emerged from uh, the, the workshop today? Actually, as key point as well, I have a far out. Last and further and last question for, for Ellen. So let's imagine we have to place emphasis somewhere because uh, yeah, in the scenario that we have uh, finally been given a lot of funding nationally for, uh, <laughs> for, uh, for addressing an issue. And you have covered the data literacy in, in, in education um, uh, topic from two angles. One is, the teachers, uh, teachers need to develop their data literacy competencies for themselves for, teach, for teaching better, or and the other angle is teachers need to, uh, to um, know how to teach data literacy to the, to, to the students because it's a very important, uh, it's, a, it's a very important uh, um, competence and, and skill and, and for life to have so in where would we want to place the emphasis with within the both uh, within these two angles well it, it's it's interesting you ask that question because um i i think every it's contingent upon every citizen to know how to use data responsibly uh and i'm i'm going to and this is not intended to be polit political but I heard uh, Barack Obama speak earlier this year, and he was asked, um, what does he think needs to happen in sort of in the wake of all of the misinformation, malinformation, disinformation? And he said, we need to help students to understand fact 
evidence data. Now, he, as a former president, is saying that children need to understand evidence. And there's a professor at Columbia University who is teaching information literacy to, student, to students, and they're succeeding in being able to determine fact from fiction. So I would question why we, don't, we can't with adults as well. Um, and we, we probably all know the answer to that. But taking from sorry, Ellen, a hundred percent on that one. The adults, I mean, they're already yep. ruining the world as it is. Let's educate them for evidence data because it goes to the confirmation bias and the political yeah. emphases and all of that. That I maintain that at least in the United States, our education system failed. We would not have been in the hot mess we were in for the last several years had people not been able to understand what's real, what's data, what's fact. Um, and so educators are the key fulcrum here to making that happen. The educators need to be um, build their capacity. The students themselves need to be their own data-driven decision makers, parents and consumers of information as well. There are a lot of new books out about misinformation and all of that. If we can help people become more data savvy, data literate, we're going to have an improved society. That would be my hope. And I apologize, but I'm going to have to hop off. But um, it's been an honor, a pleasure. And David, definitely be in touch because um, uh, I want to hear more about the, the ethics thing. Email is almost sent. <laughs> Honestly, okay. Thank you, Ellen. Enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Ellen. Yes. So I think that makes a, quite a nice uh, wrap up of the whole uh, of of the of this workshop yeah um and it's very uh, great to end with uh, ellen's uh, uh contribution i think i it was uh, she was very very interesting <laughs> yeah and i thought yeah and i thought um you yeah i'm very glad that you you met all each other and that you met ellen because she's very interactive and she's she's up for things all the time and, and it looks uh, and she's very proactive and I, I don't know. I think, uh, yeah. I, I always think of this uh, data literacy community to bring it forward and to and to keep doing uh, this kind of uh, events and things together and and maybe um, all these seminars, uh, workshops, uh, uh, co-writing papers, and uh, and we are thinking of a special issue as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I will send you an email about that. I mean, I know I avoid to disturb you uh, before the this event, to, but uh, yeah. I will come back to you and uh, Juliana for the special issue. Right? Yeah, but yeah, but what, what I mean with this uh, uh, special issue is that that this is a way for all of us to keep yeah, sure. uh, to keep engaged in this uh, in this uh, data uh, literacy uh, driven community. Mainly, uh, uh, mainly because the two projects that that were uh, keeping us together have finished. Mm. So uh, we have to keep uh, we have to keep doing uh, these kind of things. We are also thinking, uh, and that goes especially well. That that goes to everyone, but especially to you, David. We are thinking of putting together as well a kind of a data literacy observatory in which we can keep. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, we can have an umbrella for all these actions uh, and, and all these events that we organized and to keep bringing people into into the into the data literacy community i sometimes post in in uh, use hashtags every now and then in in, the, in in linkedin and not so much in twitter but um but i will yeah and um, and this is uh, this is uh, the way we, we we want to do it. So we are going to keep your contacts, and we are going to keep you uh, aware of what we are up to, and see if we can consolidate and, and grow a, a network and a community in that respect. Isn't it, Dave, uh, David? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's ex exactly our aim, and uh, would be very very um, interesting to do that and to. Um, keep um, um, to, to have a, a, 
a huge community uh, in, in behind the, the, the data literacy that can collect all data literacy experiences that are um, uh, conducting all over Europe and yeah also have a an umbrella uh, for all the events that are related to the data literacy as this one that we have had today. Okay, so. Well, as all Carl, those who have a, yeah. Yes, sorry. As Callum also mentioned, we also have contacts who are doing specific data literacy focused activities in outside of Europe. So Canada is a big one. Australia is quite a big one. So it would be interesting to potentially think about what might an event look like that's inclusive of those audiences for the next one as your projects, as you say, come to an end. What does it look like? And maybe the ODI could help steward an event with your assistance. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I thought bringing Ellen uh, would bring a, a kind of United States. Uh, uh, yeah, that's good. OK, so mm -hmm. then uh, this is uh, the, the we, yeah, we can say that the workshop is over, but this is not over at all. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for those who have attended uh, the workshop. Uh, um, all along uh, uh, and those who have attended just a, a, a little bit of it. Uh, thank you very much for your time, for taking your time to to, to be with us uh, for all this whole afternoon, uh, knowing how difficult it is to set to to set to, to, to combine block so agenda. much to block to block so much time in in, in, in the same day. And um, I hope to to keep um, uh, seeing you so seeing you in in other uh, in other adventures of data and data literacy <laughs> indeed thanks so much see you around thank you thanks thank so you very much thank you bye, bye.